please let me know when you guys are ready to hit. Some people are not happy with the before Lingo. before we start chatting, and that's Q, of course. No, it's um, testing out. No, of course, of yeah, course. Yeah. But I'm just letting you know in case you guys missed it. Yeah. They say these rubbish chats before I speak to the guests seem unprofessional and clumsy. Oh, yeah, but you see, those are people who watch ENCA. Yeah. People who must really decide what we want. Man. No, 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 I know. I'm just letting you know that there's feedback. That's all. I mean, I'm chilled regardless. Okay. So. Yeah, okay, we can cancel that. No, you don't, you don't have to. It's just, a, it's just a thing. There was one where people were like, uh, fuck, love the chats before you guys went live. And then obviously, I want to do more conversation. But, but, but there is a... a, a yeah, I can understand though, because if you, if you've been you have this thumbnail of someone that you want to see, mm. the first the thing you want to hear is actually the convo. There but, is a. But you do have a membership, so you know those chats maybe could just be given out to the members, as extra bonus to what they Page. they pay the for. Before you know? before we shoot. Yeah. Before the shoot, ten minutes before we go live. Because those before conversations are typically more. Uh, um, more people would sort of consider them more genuine sometimes than the actual conversation, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, does my Vaseline show on camera? No. Not at all. Yeah. Thank you. May we hit? We've been hitting. No, you can't say we've been hitting because I said some things that <laughs> shouldn't be on camera. Yeah, but I can see an option. Uh before we start officially, Sizwe Homoto, since you guys are here, congrats on a hundred thousand subscribers. Um, me and Debs are because we think we're fucking thugs don't believe in celebrating such things but for the benefits of the audience and you guys as the team and for Q and Yenzi as well man I just want to say thank you so much um, for this I think it's a small mind milestone because we're still gonna fucking be huge but congrats man I love you guys and yeah I appreciate you uh, Grey Chabesi the great Grey Chabesi Good pen. I fucking love your name, man. It sounds like a superhero. Great job, Yeah, Anyways, it helps. Welcome, bro. How are you? Good, bro. Can't complain. How are you? I'm all right. Where have you been? Where are you coming from? Because you're never in one place. I've been around, um, mostly in Africa right now, running a few operations. And uh, well, I was in, in Rwanda, I think the last time we talked. And then I hit Dubai and then I ended up in SA. So, yeah. Yeah. I was in Dubai for the first time recently. Mm. Uh, well, I didn't get to experience Dubai. I was inside the airport, which doesn't count. Yeah, that doesn't uh, count. Yeah, it doesn't count. <laughs> but I felt like, ah, I'm in Dubai. And and maybe before we start, sh should we start here? No, let's let's dial it all the way back. Okay. Um, I'm going to pretend like I don't know you. Who is Kray Chabesi? Where did you grow up? Um, yeah, let's, let's just start from the beginning. Yeah, so there is, uh, I was born in Malawi. I could start it like that. And then... Where in so, Malawi? In Lilongwe. Lilongwe, yeah, which Lilongwe. is the capital of Malawi. Yes. Okay. So that was the first chapter of my life until I was like 16, 17. And then I moved to South Africa, Cape Town, Delft. And that was... Where? This, Delft? Delft, yeah. Uh, it's just next to Kailicha. Okay. Is, a, is it a township? Yeah. Delft? Delft, yeah. In Cape Town? It's one of the wildest, as real as it gets, townships. You don't want to mess with Delft. Really? People don't speak about Delft. You always hear about Nyanga and the oh, violence and the Cape I mean, Flats. You can look at the numbers. It's one of the most dangerous. Delft. Yeah. Cheers. Exactly. Before we get to Cape Town, how was life in Malawi? What languages do you guys speak there? You mm. know, how was life in Malawi? So, you know, Malawi is one of the poorest countries on the planet. And it's also known as a very peaceful country. So it's very chilled, typical uh, African country very different from South Africa. Um, the economy is obviously not as big, but growing up, you're just doing, you're playing football and climbing trees and you're in the hood. You don't really know much and you don't think much of it, but there is extreme poverty. But because you're growing up in that environment, mm. you don't have anything to compare it to. So it was actually a fun childhood in a lot of ways because we used to play football. We used to make footballs from... Trash. So you take a bunch of plastic trash, bags, plastic bags. I know that around. life, boy. Yeah, you know the deal. So that was growing up, playing football every day, and after the 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 match, you get into fist fights, and then you fight for about two hours, and later on, your mother is gonna come screaming your name out there. It's time to go home. So it's like, oh, 
I just passed my curfew. It's eight o'clock. You gotta get home. First of all, it's for fun. Yeah, it was just part of the deal. You boys, know? boys are such rubbish. Yeah, because we, we, you know we would play a match, and everybody wants to win. So let's say my street against yours, and you don't want to concede defeat. Yes. So you want the game to keep going yeah. so that you can revet, you can um, score back and win, mm-hmm. and then the end result is just going to be violence to make sure this is settled. So that's how we grow up. That's important for young boys, no? I think it's very important, yes. Character building. Absolutely. Have you, I don't know if you've traveled South Africa. Extensively. Yeah, not extensive, not as much as I would like to, but I have done a fair share of it, yeah. Have you seen any part of South Africa that feels like Lilongwe? Yeah, I mean, a little bit of Limpopo kind of does. Okay. Some parts of Limpopo kind of Village. does. Village? Yeah. You know, I I ask this because I've explained to people that haven't traveled outside of South Africa that Mm. South Africa is unique. One of the reasons South Africa is unique is because you can almost get a piece of any country, city here. True. Depending on where you are. And you you can almost tell people if you want to experience Malawi, go to this village at Limpopo. If Mm -hmm. you want to experience New York, go to this specific street street in Santon. If you want to experience... And we've got... uh, Fordsburg, Mayfair, which feel a little India, Yeovil, Hillbro, which have parts of Africa, um, China Mall, Crown Mines, you know, it, it, it makes South Africa quite unique. You didn't know you were poor because you hadn't been exposed. Absolutely, yeah. And you know what, speaking to that, when I made a, I made a documentary recently uh, about this because my, I was just documenting my entire journey and I put a video out that said I grew up in a poor area in Lilongwe area 25 and people in Malawi watched that video and they attacked me saying, what do you mean area yeah. 25 is, is poor? It's just like, I get it. Like, if you don't know anything different, mm-hmm. it's very difficult for you to understand how bad the situation is, you know. The danger of exposure. Do you think exposure is dangerous? No, it's it's a very good thing. You you have to know and be aware of your position in life. You know, just like someone who drives a, a BMW here mm-hmm. and think that they have made it, you go to Dubai, you feel like a nobody. Again. Oh boy! <laughs> you know, I think you have to. You have to. I've got a little story, man, and I think I may have told it on this platform before. Mm. I had. Like, I've got all these fantasy wishes. And while we were speaking about plastic bags and balls, I'm just thinking, I wonder if that could be a project mm-hmm. on how to recycle plastic and have these soccer balls. Because all the kids in all the townships in poor neighborhoods, not yes. just on the continent, but everywhere, taking old plastic bags and creating a ball is a thing. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if there could be a project to recycle plastic bags into balls. One of my ideas was to take kids from poorer areas and expose them to the city life. Mm. Uh, I'm from Guazulu Natal, so you'd go to the villages there, bring the kids to Johannesburg, take them to Gold Reef City, um, take them to Santon, get them to sleep in a nice hotel, give them the best food. And in my head, Mm. the thinking was, once they're exposed to that and see Ferraris and Lamborghinis, they will go home and be inspired and want to be ambitious and achieve but I watched some content and I spoke to some people and I realized there's a danger with exposure because not all kids, when you expose them, are driven. Some of them, for the first time, realize that I'm actually poor. Yes. And it depresses them. And they get home and all of a sudden their parents are not good enough. They don't want to play with this ball made of plastic bags. They're like, Ugh, you guys are poor and we're dirty and our shirts are torn. And some of them don't have the ability to become super athletes super business people, Mm -hmm. and they might even go into crime, selling drugs because they saw something and they're like, I want it, but since I can't get it the legit way, I will, you know, you believe exposure is a good thing. You come to Cape Town. How did you get to Cape Town? Um, So a family friend of ours was driving um, cargo trucks coming into South Africa. Yeah. So I made a deal with them to basically take me with so that I could save money. So I paid um, less than what a bus cost. I mean, the bus transport would cost me. Yeah. And instead of taking me about maybe two days to get here, to get to Johannesburg, it took me about two weeks. Jeez. Yeah. Because you didn't mind? 
I mean, I didn't have enough money to, mm. to complain about it, right? So this guy was working, obviously. So he had to make a lot of stops. And then we had some breakdowns on the way. Mm. But I was just young. I was just excited that, you know, I'm going to South Africa. Uh, my, my dad was already living here. I was starting a new life. And I had all these dreams playing in my head. And my goal was to make 3,000 Rand. I was like, okay. Yeah, the goal was to, <laughs> the goal was to, to, to get to South Africa to, to study. Basically, that was the idea. Okay. But my goal was like, man, I just want to make three grand and then I'm out of there. I'll go back to, to Malawi and start a business. Oh, you wanted to make 3,000 as a grand. lump sum? Yes. And then use it as an investment? And Yeah, and leave, exactly. So I would say, uh, my thought was like, okay, I'll be in school, studying university, whatever. Mm. And then I'll take the, I'll, I'll, I'll be working on this side. And after I make three grand, I'm just going to leave. Mm. Yeah, that was the goal. Were you a good student? No, I've never been a good student. I don't even remember doing homework in my entire school life. Jeez. Yeah. Is school like a thing in Malawi? Yeah, it's big. It's the number one thing because every parent overinvests in their children's education. Mm. Yeah, it's even way more. It's almost like China style. Okay. Like everybody wants their children to be educated. And that's where a lot of emphasis and most of the parents, I would say, spend most of their money on is to get their children into education so but i just wasn't really i didn't see the why of what why i was doing it so i was good enough to just get the bare minimum to get mm. to the next class and that was easy for me like i didn't have to study i was never the hard working student at all yeah. yeah and not not even the top student neither i just did the bare minimum if the bare minimum is 50 percent for a test mm. i would just get that do you think schooling is the way out generally for the masses, for the poor masses? Because poor people generally believes, believe schooling is the way. Do you agree? It's the biggest scam out there right now. It's that, you know, you get education and then after that you escape poverty. Mm. I get it. I get why people think like that, because from the background that a lot of us are coming from, it used to be the line between acceptance and abandonment. So they would say, look, you cannot, uh, you're not allowed to have these opportunities because you're not educated. It used to okay. be an excuse, right? So most of our, the generation behind us believe that, look, you need to go get the education to be allowed to just play the game. But in reality, you, you realize that it's just a bunch of garbage. Mm. You, you spend all your money. Some of them, some of your parents are going through debt to just get you into university. Yeah. I don't understand why things that you would learn it would take you six months for you to learn has to take four years. It's yeah. simply because it's a business, right? So if you look, if you follow the money, you understand that the whole game, it's not really about education. It's just a business for the banks and a couple of other people. And if you analyze it as an investment, mostly then it's a bad investment if you can't even make your money back. What would you propose as a, as a solution? I like the fact that you're saying in the past, your schooling, I, I prefer using the word schooling mm. because people, when you when you bash schooling, people think you're bashing education. education yeah. Um, schooling was used as an exclusionary tool. You are talented, you are smart, you are capable. Mm. <sighs> Unfortunately, you don't have the certificate. So then you kind of have to spend all this money just to get the paper of something that you could already do. Yeah. What would be your counter solution to particularly the poor masses around the world if... If you're going to say schooling is a scam, mm -hmm. they're like, okay, great. We agree with you. But then what must we do? I think most people are better off learning to do th real things. So you can imagine someone who goes to university for four years and they have a degree in some social science. Like, what do they really know? What can they do? Mm. If you think about it. I'm not going to answer that because I'm going to get dragged for bashing social sciences. We well, love social sciences. Yeah, sure. No, I'm so, kidding, I'm so, kidding. So, a lot of sciences, people bash right? the non-STEM subjects and a lot of the social sciences. I'm, I'm, a lot one, of the kids I'm one of those people. Who are graduates, unfortunately, have a lot of those type of qualifications. Or who are unemployed. Right. Unemployed graduates tend to have those qualifications. Right. So most people are better off learning something practical to do, right? Like it can be anything. As long as you, as an individual, can be able to do something on your own without relying on uh, a corporate structure, Mm. you're better off than someone who just got a degree in some social science somewhere yeah. in a lot of ways. And I hear people talk about, oh, not everybody can be an entrepreneur. It's like, oh, you can. If you have a practical skill, mm. 
you can actually be in, an independent service provider. Yeah. You need the corporate structure when you don't have a real skill. All you have is basically uh, a schooling paperwork, some mm -hmm. sc schooling paperwork, right? And you need a machine to operate in. But if you remove the machine, you become useless. Yeah. And that's where the unemployment is coming into place. Show me an engineer who can actually do things in the real world, who would struggle for an with unemployment for six years. Mm -hmm. Show me a plumber mm -hmm. who is complaining about unemployment. So most people are better off just learning a real skill, you know, some software development, um, construction, and so many other skills. And a lot of these skills you don't really need to, to, to go to university at all. Yeah. You can do them, you can learn them on your own. And I did that, that's why I can say that. Like, you know, I taught myself a few skills. Huh? I'm just thinking in my head of what you said. People say not everyone can be an entrepreneur. That's not and true. And you're saying as long as you have a practical skill, you can become an independent service provider. Yeah. Which would mean... Get a practical skill and then add marketing. Mm -hmm. How do you market that you have a practical skill and then some level of pricing? How do you price for it? Mm -hmm. And you're an entrepreneur. Practical skill plus marketing plus pricing makes you an entrepreneur. Yeah, look, so you can just think of it like this. Every company that has people working for it, mm -hmm. anyone in that company can be an independent service provider. Yeah. Right. The only reason that you have to become an employee, it's simply because it's easier for government to collect taxes from you. OK. So if you're a doctor, if you are, uh, it means you can become an independent contractor. Yeah. Right. If you're a plumber, you can become an independent contractor, yeah. an engineer working for Sasso or whoever. You can work with Sasso as an independent contractor. Mm. So this. Uh, idea of that not everybody can become an entrepreneur. I don't understand it. You don't. It doesn't mean that you have to do all the marketing and everything for you, yeah. but you can own your work and institutionalize it in a way as a business. Let's say the marketing part is being handled by someone else. You mm -hmm. can get an. You can pay an agency to say, look, yeah. you bring me projects. You take five percent of what I earn or whatever. Right. So yeah. being an entrepreneur does not mean that you have to run a full on business with all the departments. It's just owning your work. Do you think it's done intentionally? Do you think, you spoke about government collecting taxes. Do you think mm. it's done intentionally that schooling has almost today removed all the practical skills? At some point, kids would do agriculture, woodwork, uh, fitting and turning. Kids would do typing. Kids would do home economics, which is cooking and baking. They've removed all of that. Mm -hmm. All that's left is what you're saying. This soft skill where I can only be useful if there's a laptop, if there's internet and if there's a big company around me, mm -hmm. once that's gone, I can't do anything. Do you think it's intentional? Well, you have to understand also that the, it's just how society works. Mm. If you look at the animal kingdom, right, the antelopes or the, the, the spring box, what do they exist for? The buck. Yeah, the buck. They mm. only exist to be eaten by <laughs> This the, guy, like, you can't say that. Oh, well, it is true, <laughs> right? <laughs> So humanity is exactly the same. They as, exist uh, only to be eaten. Absolutely. So humanity Jeez. is... That's a, a lion mindset. Bro, like the, the world works exactly the same way. The poor are only there to serve the rich, to make the rich comfortable. So if you... You, you fundamentally believe in what you're saying. 100%. I mean... The poor... Only exist. Like Buck... Yes. Are designed to be useful for the rich. If we if you are not if you are not the part of the elite, like we all exist to serve the rich. And I think the journey of life is basically you trying to get your to get yourself out of that lane as much as you can. It can be a lifetime battle to get out, but it's worth fighting for, right? But so you you, you ask the question about is this done intentionally? I mean, of course, you're being trained to serve the rich by working through the, in, in their companies or pay them taxes in some, in some way or another. So who pays the most taxes? It's the middle class. The middle class, the yeah. doctors, all the most important yeah, professions, professions you can think. They, they have no way to own their work and actually control their legacy in many ways. Yeah. You cannot work as a doctor at a, um, with the government while being an independent contractor in a lot of ways. You have to be employed. When you're employed, your taxes are collected before you and even get And they own your check. time. They own your time, absolutely, yeah. right? Whereas it's, if you start your own business, it means that you collect all the money, mm. then you deal with the taxes yourself after. Yeah. An employee mm. does not have that liberty. The taxes are collected before mm. you even get your That's money. That's Robert Kiyosaki, boy. 
Yeah, yeah. there you go. So Robert Kiyosaki says, pay yourself first. Yeah. But then if you're an employee, you basically you're cannot. Forced. You're, you're forced, forced to, to pay, pay someone else first. first. You know. So that is just the concept of you're just serving the elite. That's what you exist for. You can be allowed to have family, raise children, just like the, the, uh, the spring box mm -hmm. in the jungle. But if you look around what they do, they're always paranoid. They're always looking around. They never settle. They're always scared because they know that they exist to be eaten out there. Do you remember the two-week journey from Lilongwe to Cape Town? Yeah, you know, it's full of, I, I remember, I remember it more, more as, a, as a fantasy. I learned a lot in, on the, in the, I mean, I, so <laughs> we would stop in Zimbabwe. This guy who was driving me, you know, he drinks a lot. And <laughs> so we'd stop in all these bars in remote areas like mm -hmm. Shabins. You right? were 16, 17? Yes. Okay. So we, we would go to these shabins and they would meet a bunch of people there and they would order a whole lot of food around and we'd all sit there and start eating. A lot of these guys didn't really care much about what they're doing with their life or whatever. They just existed, right? Mm. And they do side hustles, helping the truck guys to sort of offload and unload kind of uh, different items. Mm. So I had to find a way to find, I had to find a way to sort of identify with them because mm. we're coming from a, a different worlds completely. Yeah. You know, I would, I had this vision that I'm going to South Africa. When I get there, I'll be doing this and this. Get my 3000 Rand boy. Then yeah. I'm get my 3000 Rand. Exactly. I'll buy a big computer and then I'll learn all these, all these skills. And these guys who are just basically worried about the next minute, Yeah. you know? So I had to deal with that and it was really cool to see, but, um, such an experience. Was it your first time outside Malawi? No, it wasn't. I had gone to Tanzania before. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you need a passport to travel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think of the movie The Lion King, mm. which is arguably one of the best, if not the best, animated movie. Yeah. And for many years, people would keep saying, this is the greatest animated movie of all time. And I used to always be like, Cap, that's rubbish. Mm -hmm. But I'm always fascinated when people hype something up and I always try and figure out why. And I... I Learned later on, especially when I started watching movies like Kung Fu Panda, which is my favorite animation, the symbolism. Number one, The Lion King is one of the few movies, I think, next to Bambi, where they highlight death. Because children are watching this. Mm. And you're teaching young kids how to deal with death when Simba loses Mufasa. Mm. Responsibility and accountability. It's my fault. But I want to raise this part of The Lion King because so many of us have a similar journey of not knowing who you are and trying to find yourself. And this theme carries through in so many different movies. It could be Black Panther, where Chala is revisiting his dad and trying to figure out who he is and who he's meant to be. Simba leaves Pride Rock and he escapes because he's running away from himself. It's the story of the prodigal son mm -hmm. in the Bible. And he goes and he finds a meerkat and a, and a, a warthog. He's chilled guys probably fucking driving a cargo truck to mm. random places going to find bugs could be booze could... hakuna matara no stress we chilled we living a good life and he escaped you know and and he got away and he numbed his pain but he was running away from his true self and in that journey at some point he gets called upon you know i, I think um there's the female lion what's her name I think Sarabi is his mom. Anyways, anyways, the ah, Nala, oh. Nala comes and, and finds him. Yeah. <laughs> Not to Nandi. Nala comes and finds him, and she's like, "We're struggling. We need you." And he's like, "No, I'm I'm living." Um. And Rafiki comes through, and he's like, "I found your father. He's like he's dead. He's like, no, I found him." And he shows him the reflection. And in that whole journey, the symbolism is you can run away. It's like the prodigal son. You can run away from who you are, but something in life will force you to return mm -hmm. to yourself because you serve a bigger purpose. And the whole story of the circle of life and him running away, and he comes back with the meerkats and the warthog because they have now become a part of his identity. Even mm -hmm. the prodigal son, when he's eaten with the pigs, and you come back with all these lessons which are meant to give you some type of character and grit. Yep. And you left Malawi, to come and make 
three grand and go back. And I don't know if you're meant to go back to Malawi or if you're meant to go back to who you were meant to be, this lion. Mm. And you're still on the journey or you've come back where you went to escape. And it's like the whole journey is about finding yourself and what you pick up along the way. So I'm just thinking of the truck ride and that's like Simba running away from Pride Rock and all these experiences that you that you get there. You get to Delft mm -hmm. eventually. Yeah. What's the experience like in Delft? Yeah, what Delph. was your dad doing, sorry, in Cape Town? Yeah, he was uh, driving trucks as well. Okay. So your dad hooked you up? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What was your mom doing in Malawi? She, my mom was doing business, so she was ordering stuff from here. She would sell them over there. In, was your dad supplying? Yeah. So yeah. They, they were... Yeah, my, mom, my mom was traveling back and forth. Oh, but it wasn't your dad? No, no, it was my mom who was doing business. My, my dad was working here in South Africa at the time. This is such an important point because mm. uh, as part of my business journey, I'd meet a lot of successful people. Mm. And a lot of them would tell you that they're an import-export. Yes. And it sounded very blurry. Like, what the hell? This sounds vague. Right. And when you study formal business, it sounds like, oh, import-export, customs duties. And yeah. import-export is a, is a woman from Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. Harare, coming to China Mall yeah. to stock and then going back in a bus. Yes. It's a woman from rural free state, Limpopo, coming here to stock. That's import-export. And a lot of our mothers especially are involved in those trades. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 a beautiful entry into business. Where am I based? What do they lack? Where do they have it? Let me go and get it and add a markup. Your mom was in the import and export business. Technically, yeah, exactly. I mean, my mom was, was always in business. When we were growing up, because we didn't have a lot, we went through a lot of different businesses. We sold water. So in Malawi, because a lot of people at the time, they didn't have refrigerators, we used to pack water in plastic bags and mm -hmm. then we'll go out in the street and s sell them to like uh to taxi drivers and stuff like just that just plastic water plastic water so i'd go in after school i would come from school get a cooler box on my head go to the street and start selling water that's that was the hustle that's so dope yeah and then she sold chicken as well she would order some uh chicken and would just s sell it out in the market as well mm -hmm. so she was always hustling uh, my grandmother also had a shabin and she was always in business. She used to be a nurse in Zimbabwe before. When Zimbabwe was, there was a time when Zimbabwe was the shit when I was really young. I no, no, Zimbabwe at some point was the yeah. fucking shit. Like people uh, in Malawi and other uh, African countries didn't even used to come to South Africa that much mm -hmm. because of obviously the, the history. Yeah. They used to go to Zimbabwe, right? So my grandmother was a nurse there. And after that, she, she doubled into business a little bit. And yeah, back to Delft. Before we go to Delft, do you, yeah. do you feel they inspired you in terms of business? My hustle? mother, my mother, yeah, yeah. Because she gave me a lot of responsibility when I was young. Like she exposed me to money. I would, she would send me to town because where we used to live, to live in Area 25, for you to find an ATM, you had to go all the way to the city. So my mother would give me her uh, bank cards to go and withdraw money for her. I would know in the house where she's keeping her uh, the, the funds, where the money is going. And then sometimes I would look at her. She used to write down all the transactions and um, the bookkeeping of the business, the yeah. small business. That's and then, bookkeeping. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So I learned that from her. And then I gained a little bit more confidence about business from her or just doing things. I just felt like more of a man when I was really young, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we're in Delft now with daddy. Yeah, bro. Were you with daddy or were you on your I, I was with, with my dad, yeah. Okay. So, you know, growing up, you watch a lot of Easy Dingo and Generations. <laughs> you have this vision of what South Africa is like. Yeah. And then you get there. I remember when my dad picked me up from where the, the truck um, dropped me. Mm -hmm. And now that was in, in Cape Town. And we're driving. I'm seeing a lot of nice sceneries, you know, like on the side of Bavo and yeah. things like that. And then you're entering into the townships. <laughs> That's when my reality started kicking in. It started to look a little different now. I'm like, wow, this is not the South Africa that I expected. You're now looking at all these homes that all look the same. Where we come from, we don't have that. We don't have the townships that are like all similar home houses and stuff. Really? Yeah. Malawi because doesn't have townships? We do have, so I come from a township technically. Okay. But the way it works is that you own land and you, you build whatever you want. That's the type of township you have. Yeah, exactly. I ask this because when you travel through Africa, people don't know a lot of townships have a similar template that has been copied. Mm. In South Africa, of course, but parts of Africa, 
there are certain, I guess you'd call them colonizers that build similar structures. And you're telling me Malawi doesn't have that type of model. It's got no. a different one. Actually, most African countries don't have this model you're talking about. They're just free range model where okay. you own the land and then you can build whatever house. So you don't, they're not that structured at all. Oh, it's like right? tribal land, I think, in it, South Africa. Yeah, you can okay. call it that because you find that you, you, you can have a piece of land with the poorest owner and they have the shittiest house they can have. The next door neighbor is big house. Yeah, rich that's guy. tribal. Tribal land is like that in exactly. South Africa. So that's the type of townships that we have. Okay. Yeah, and you, so you can be in a township but live big or you can be in the township and being the most impoverished. That's yeah. just what happens. So, so you're seeing these houses that all look the same. It's like matchbox. Yeah. Jeez. It was kind of strange and the feeling was kind of like weird. I remember it was around 6.28. PM. The time yes. you remember it. Yes. That's how much of an impact it made on you. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And then we arrive and my dad made me some tea. A couple of people came through to say hi to me. And I went out. They took me outside for a little walk. And then they started giving me instructions about where to go, mm. how to move. You cannot be outside at this time. That's the story of Simba, boy. You don't go there to where the hyenas <laughs> chill. Yeah. It's very dangerous here. You have to be careful. And then it started kicking in that, okay, I'm now in a different environment. So where I come from, I could say it was dangerous, but it wasn't that you get killed. Yeah. You just, if you're not affiliated with the right team, yeah. you might get beaten by the next guy. Yeah. That's what I, used, I was used to. But here you could actually get shot, you could get robbed, you could get stabbed. So the definition of danger immediately switched now. Yeah. It became a little bit more, more real. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Delph was like that. And eventually you stick around and you just learn the tools of the trade and you become accustomed to it. But immediately after I arrived there, mm -hmm. I knew that that's not where I wanted to be. I just wanted to be out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did you get up to when you got there? Did you go to school? Did you start hustling for your three grand? No. So what happened was I started now making moves to get into school. Mm -hmm. But when I, I got to UNISA and all these other places, I realized how expensive it was. Mm -hmm. And immediately I just knew that we can't afford it. Yeah. So there's no way. So my next move was to basically wor work with computers because before I came to South Africa, my mother had already bought me a P my first PC yeah. when I was 16. And I learned a few, th I taught myself a few things and uh, graphic design, a little bit of code. So I wanted to get into the same space. But graphic I, design and code. Yeah, like you taught coding. yourself from where? Yeah, so when I was in Malawi, what used to happen, I got my first computer mm -hmm. and then I would go to an internet cafe and download PDF tutorials. And then I would go home and spend the entire night until load shading kicks in and just teach myself Photoshop and uh, HTML, CSS, Python and things like that. Why? What, what would make you just do that? I always... so. I always wanted to have a computer my whole life. Yeah. That's what I always wanted. It was always this thing that it, it represented unlimited amount of creativity. You can make more, you can edit movies with it. You can write code, mm. you can make beats, you can do anything. It was just like that thing. Ah, fruity loops. Hey, exactly, right? So when I see a computer, to me, it just represented the, the, the level of freedom. I just wanted to be working with computers. You'd seen this on TV or with other people? I seen it on TV, and yeah. then down the street, there was this other guy called Ernest. He had a PC. Oh, Ernest. Yeah, because his family uh, were living in the U.S., so they sent him a PC. Yeah. He was an older guy, and I would go to him. I would pay him a little bit of money to use a computer for like an hour, mm. right? And he would show me what he was working on the previous night. So he was using Windows Movie Maker to make these um, movie credits at the beginning. Like yeah. he would say, dog production, and put his names and the names of his <laughs> friends and friends, you know. So I, I would watch that. I'm like, wow. So this guy, man, he has this computer and he can just do all these things like it's, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. But I could only have an hour access to it or at least what, whatever I can afford. Yeah. Next day, he would show me he made some beats, he made some music. The next day, he was recording himself some voice, you know. And then he showed me some 3D graphics another day. I was just like, man, this is what I want to be this doing. This machine is amazing. This machine is amazing. Yeah. I was like, if I, and I, I think if I had a, a computer earlier on, I wouldn't have even gone through high school at all. I just didn't care. And I'm guessing when you'd get home, you'd probably speak about the computer all the time. And your mom was like, ah, this boy. 
Yeah, exactly. My mom knew that the only the if she ever gonna impress me yeah. is if she gets me a computer. So when she gets to she go to South Africa, she stayed for a few years. She actually managed to do the trick, and then she sent it to me. Jeez, shout out to your mom, bro. Yeah, exactly. She is. So that was your plan. Leave Malawi. Go get computers. Go back to Malawi and fuck yeah. shit up. Maybe set up an internet cafe, which yep. is a boss business for many people. Straight up. Or maybe offer solutions. Like, I've got a computer. I can do your graphics. I can do your video. I can... Mm. Um, I don't know if you know Ashish Takar. Yes. the a, a, Is it Essa guy? Essa? Yeah. What's Essa? Essa is a computer brand. It's a South African, yeah. Oh, I don't know it. I know Atlas, uh, which is the company that I associate. Atlas, Atlas Mara. So Ashish, I think his parents may have taken him to the UAE. Mm. I think. I stand to be corrected. I think at the age of 15, they were going on a holiday. Uh, they bought him a computer there, his first computer. He went back. I don't know if he's from Uganda or where he is, but mm. he's a Indian, West Asian yeah. guy. And when he got back, apparently, like, it blew the minds of his teachers, his friends, and all of them were like, we want this machine. Yeah. And at the age of 15, he asked his parents to please go back. I don't know if it was Dubai or parts of the UAE. I want to go and fetch more of these and sell it to my teachers and my schoolmates. Yeah. They allowed him. He made so much money that he asked them, can I please quit school to start this business? And they were like, we're giving you one year. Mm. And that was the end of schooling for him. And I think at the age of 31, he became the wealthiest the youngest, wealthiest African. At age 31, he was a dollar billionaire. Mm. And Atlas Mara, they tried to set up a cell phone manufacturing business in Durban, I think. Uh, I think it fell apart and he's been involved in other businesses as well. The story of, of the computer and then obviously when you add the internet has been a game changer for so many people. Yeah. Sorry. So you realize Unisa is expensive. Yeah, I don't have money, but I know I want a computer. Yeah, so I had a few skills. I was and I was overly confident about my skills. I thought I was the shit, you know. Like <laughs> Photoshop wise, I was like, man, I know how to I'll uh, make your CV, boy. Thing. Exactly right. So in the hood, thankfully in Delft, I met this other guy who had a computer. He was like the cool guy in the area. Yeah. Uh, everybody was going to him to burn CDs yeah. and get music from. I what was his name? Bright Brighton. So we have Ernest, we have Brighton. These yeah. are game changers in the story. Game changers. Very important people to meet yeah. to this day still. So this guy, um, he, I met him and he was like, oh man, you can do all these things because I came with my own pack of CDs with all the uh, cracked software in there that you, obviously we couldn't buy it. I installed <laughs> it on this computer and showed them how it works and we started a business. Shout out to Piracy. Exactly, bro. You know, um, Pirate Bay and all of those guys, <laughs> shout out to them. <laughs> They changed my life, bro. Oh, jeez, we must cancel that out. That is so wrong. But shout out to Piracy. <laughs> Look, it helped a lot of people. And shout out to, I guess, Abu Musk. Because today we've got open source and those things. I mean, look, the, the software companies know this, right? Like Adobe know that the, a guy like me wouldn't afford their software. Yeah. The only way was to get the crack version. Now I subscribe and I pay them 3,000 rand a month or something, yeah. right? So it's all good. Um, but so with this guy, we started a business now where I would edit photos of people and put them on a fancy car, you know, oh. the hood style, right? And then we would get them printed for them. So dope. Exactly. And then we would make a little bit of money. So while I was still in the hood, I would make like, you know, a, a little bit of money there, a little bit, uh, a little bit of cash. And I would also download new songs from an internet cafe. And when these guys come, would uh, give them new music, would clean out viruses from flash drives because everybody was struggling with that problem. Yeah. So I was still using my skills to get a few things done and being able to make money. But the big game changer was I made a, uh, I made a new friend. His name was Lumagnano. Who? Lumagnano. Lumagnano. Yeah. From where? From Delft. South African? Yes. Lumagnano. 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 Okay. Yeah. So this guy... He, he was like a musical genius, young, and he lived in Delft with his mother. His dad was staying in Kailicha. Mm. So we used to go to Kailicha back and forth and stuff. We're just having fun. So there was two different mentalities here, right? The, um, the foreign community, the immigrant community, mm. they had a different approach to life. They were much more fearful about things. Mm. Even when I talked, I talked to them about what I wanted to do, I might want to do this computer thing. They was like, oh, that is for white people. You don't, can't expect to be doing that. Mm. You should be waking up in the morning and join us on the ground. And, you know, we have to go get the grind. The South African guys, they had a little bit more chewed approach about things. They were uh, enthusiastic. Mm. 
uh, they didn't have the same kind of limits that most foreign guys were thinking because the foreign communities, the mentality was what I had as well of like, I'm just here to, cons- to, gra- to grab as much capital as I can yeah. and then leave. So you go into their homes, they would have like a bunch of TVs and monitors, electronics yeah. that they, accum- they have been accumulating for four years, yeah. hoping that one day they'll go back home and then they'll talk- take all that shit with them. You know, including yeah. even one of my dad's friend who unfortunately passed away because he got shot in Delft uh, about two, three years ago. Yeah. Shit. Sorry he also had a, he also had a PC that I, I was using at the time, you know. Mm. Yeah. So Lemagnano exposed me to a lot of things. He was a musical genius. Mm. Now he's in the U.S. By the way, he went to UCT, did music. Now he's in the U.S. That's too dope. Exactly, bro. So yeah. he was like the hood hero. He had his own band called the Delft Big Band and he had a camera. So he would give it to me. I would travel with them around the neighborhoods when they go to perform music. They had a a gospel band. That exposed me to a lot of things and gave me a little bit of work to experiment with. Mm. So I would shoot, get photos, then I'll go to Brighton House, edit them, make small videos, give it to um, Lumaniano and his team, and they would love it. Bro, it's crazy good days. So I remember we'd go. <laughs> Those to, are good days, boy. <laughs> we'd go to like Stellenbosch. Mm. These guys, they they would hire a taxi. We're performing in Stellies. Grab your camera, come shoot us. Mm. And on our way there, we'd buy like uh, a big bottle of um, Coca Cola yeah. or what is this uh, fizzy drink? That's a ginger. It's a ginger. Stony. Stony. Stony, yeah. And Stony, and we'd all, we'd all be drinking from the same big two liter bottle yeah. with a straw. You know the deal, right? Yeah. yeah. It was really like a real family with these guys. So we would go out there, film, and have fun. And then eventually I started hustling now to make real money because all these things were cool to create a network, mm. but I wasn't really making serious amount of money. Yeah. So I went into the typical immigrant hustle. Um, to work gardening and work in wealthy peop- uh, people's homes, cut grass and earn a hundred rand a day. You weren't making that type of money with the computer work and the camera work. It was inconsistent. Oh, okay, yes. I hear you. Yeah, it wasn't. And the really gardening was like once you found this white man in his rich house, at mm. least every time they call you, guaranteed hundred rand a day. So it was informal employment, right? You have one guy who has a deal somewhere. Mm. To say, look, I have this place that I work in Sea Point. You can come and grind for a day. Yeah. Right. And they're looking for guys tomorrow. So do you want to go do it at seven tomorrow? I'd be like, oh, at seven a.m. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Then I would just go there with them. We grind. I get my hundred bucks, and it would cost me about maybe forty rand a day to go there. So I would, yeah. I would walk away with like sixty bucks yeah. a day. So maybe I do that for three days. And then another day, I would also do it and I'll save a little bit of money. Eventually, my dad also gave me a little bit of capital now. He gave me 600 rand. Plus the little money that I had, I bought the first computer here. Yeah. Even though it was switching off every two hours because it was, (laughs) I bought it off Gumtree, you know. (laughs) But that was a big game changer because now I could learn the thing. So when I got here, I realized that the skill that I have was basically inadequate. Because I was making calls or uh, I would just go to other offices trying to apply for a job as a graphic designer or whatever. They will look at my shit and be like, bro. This is they, whack. They were really polite about it. <laughs> 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 they, they would say, but this is not necessarily what we, the type of work that we do. Yeah. Because, you know, when I was in, in Malawi, I was working with my friends who were in the music industry. In the hood, that's what you're used to, right? I'll make posters about... The shows that they, they, they're about to do, I would yeah. work on some music videos. So my portfolio had that kind of work. Yeah. I'm thinking of a CV. There's that CV light blue font that it's like everyone knows how to do <laughs> Curriculum vitae. Yes. Like, yeah. I can do this. And everyone's like, ah, yeah. with cheap ink yeah. that is faded. Exactly. So I went in and then I started um, digging more into 3D animation. Yeah. So... I then just started teaching myself Cinema 4D. Even though I didn't like school, I personally liked physics. I was I was a nerd anyway, but like in things that I was really interested in. Yeah. So I that's a, a that's a very important point. I have to say this. I apologize. I speak to a lot of parents, mm. and a lot of them have been sold this. I call it a scam of ADHD and putting their kids on drugs, Ritalin, etc. Yeah. And they'll the teacher and the 
psychologist, or whatever, will say the child struggles to concentrate. They after 10 minutes of maths, their mind wanders, etc. After, and then they'll be like, but his games, he'll, he'll sit for three hours. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this child doesn't have a concentration problem. They have an interest problem. Give them something they're interested in and they will go in. They, you won't have to tell them. Mm -hmm. They will go and download the PDFs yeah. and no one is watching you. You're studying them overnight. Yeah. But this, they have no interest in this. That's why they lose concentration. Yeah. Sorry, so physics. Yeah, so I had never I had never liked maths in school at all. Yeah. You know, I just hated it. So just to add to what you're saying, and it was only I got into programming that I realized how important math was and I just started loving it, you know, embracing it. Math. I learned ma mathematics on my own, basically. Through program because it was relevant. It to was what relevant, you were interested exactly. In. I would re I would spend the whole night trying to research a uh, specific uh, side of mathematics simply because I want to understand or achieve a certain outcome, right? Yeah. Either to create like some kind of a little algorithm or script. Yeah. So I was doing Python. Um, I was scripting Photoshop basically. Python is a coding language. Yeah. Yeah. So I was teaching myself how to script Photoshop to make it do things that, you know, would just to automate a lot of things. So that's how I got introduced into math in a way that I embraced it, yeah. right? Re Phys relevant education will always win. Oh, Abstract yeah. education, you're like, why am I studying cumulonimbus clouds? And yeah. in South Africa, our favorite is labeling the locust. How does it affect <laughs> what I'm gonna eat today? Exactly, right? Yeah. So 3D animation had a lot of physics in it because you could simulate real uh, reality yeah. within your computer, right? Using real, natural phenomena. So you have wind, you got gravity, you got all these other forces that actually exist in the real world and you can simulate oceans, clouds, and all these complicated things. So that's what I became more interested in. And then on this crappy computer, I was teaching myself lighting, rendering, and things like that. And the next move I made was that in Cape Town, I took an internship and paid. And the game was that I can now have unlimited internet access. Because I looked at what they were looking for. They look they were looking for someone to do an intern for video editing. It was a fashion, fashion company, mm -hmm. small fashion company. I went in there, say, Oh, I can do all these things, and my portfolio was above what they needed. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I don't have to make the money from there. I would still do the other side hustles mm -hmm. as long as I can have internet access there. So I would make sure that whatever they need me to work on, I'm done by one o'clock but I, would, I wouldn't deliver it. But I would sit from one until five and just scratching the internet for things that I need to download, yeah. right? Download videos, learn new things, so that when I get home, I will spend the entire night going through all the material. And that was a, a big game changer for me because now I have internet, and the next move after now my skill level was good enough, yeah. I applied for an internship uh, at a studio called Wicked Pixels. Yeah, It's one of the actually top animation studios in South Africa. Wicked Pixels. Pixels yeah. Okay. Uh, this lady called Saskia, Saskia Bush, she gave me an opportunity there uh, to, to go there like two or three times a week, I think. Yeah. Unpaid as well. And- Oh, they were so happy to hire you. Yeah, but there to be honest- Exploiting immigrants, boy. Not really. That's what people, that's- No, you were learning. You had a, yeah. you had a strategy. I'll, 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 I'll be fair. At, okay. at Wicked Pixels, I offered, I added nothing to, to to whatever they were doing. Okay. I think she just liked my attitude and enthusiasm and she believed in in me that I could do it because it's hard work. And they right? didn't have to pay you. All I, I'm saying is when you, doing see, when you see immigrants, boy, yeah. and they're like, it's fine, don't pay me. I just want to be here. Business people get excited. Yeah, I mean, there is a little bit of that that happens. It happened to me eventually, but in this, my I was applying to go there and learn. Yeah. Right, because I couldn't afford to go to the animation school. It was like sixty thousand rand a year or something. Yeah. There was no way we could we could pay that. So these guys were working on pep commercials and um, the real life action movies, like doing animation and rendering. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there looking at these guys. They were working on pep today. Oh, we have an Edgar's commercial, and I would just sit work on my own projects like particle simulations, fire and smoke and stuff. And then I would ask them questions and they would literally take 30 minutes of their time to yeah. explain to me exactly what's going on. That's dope. Right? In a few months, then I was able to start making money online through the skills that I learned from there. You know, one of the most underappreciated and not discussed avenues of learning is apprenticeship. Yeah. 
obviously it would be nice to get a stipend, at least money to travel. But even if not, to what you're saying, 60,000 rand a year versus volunteering. And not every place is going to take you, even mm. if you volunteer for free. But find a way to volunteer for free to learn. Because you're not getting paid 60,000, yeah. but you're saving 60,000 and learning, which is almost a payment. Yeah, I think that's that's so dope. And the other thing is people don't know how to exploit their workspace. Um, I love the story of I'd stop working at one, but I wouldn't deliver until five. Mm -hmm. We've got so many stories of using the company telephone, using company internet. And sometimes when you work for a big company and you're pushing your own hustle, the fact that your signature is from a big company, people want to work with you just for that. Yeah. And a lot of people are sleeping on the free telephone, free internet, free office space. You've already got a network here and then the brand reputation. When I was working at Standard Bank, as an example, I did removals. You can imagine if I'm quoting, invoicing someone, but I'm sending it from a Standard Bank. Your oh, Standard Bank is going to hammer me. I'm sending it to the Standard Bank signature. It's like, this is a credible person yeah. linked to a big company. But apprenticeship, apprenticeship, especially for poor people, go to the spaces of what you want to learn. It doesn't have to be fancy, like programming or computer work. It can be plumbing. It yep. can be, be just go with that guy and be like, I'll just carry your tools. I'll just be there to wipe the floor when you, I'll just be the cameraman. Absolutely. Because I just want to learn. I yep. just want, I can't afford school and you look like you're doing something progressive. Mm. I just want to learn. That yes. was uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Where Jonah Hill is like, if you can show me proof that you earn this <laughs> oh. much, I'll fucking quit my job right now and work for you. <laughs> Absolutely. And fu the funny thing is that at the end of it, when I came out of that internship, I was actually better than the graduates from the universities. Some of them. I, I would say a lot of them. Like yes, my yes. skill set level was like above there. Shout out to Wicked Pixels and yeah, Saskia. Exactly, right? So, you know, it just shows you that if you really want to do it, you can't. In that context, you can't really make an excuse at all. Oh, I didn't do this. And especially in a practical environment yeah. where you don't have to prove your work by saying, oh, I went to this university whatsoever. You, in this industry, you just show your work, right? Yeah. Like show the, what you have. And yeah. if people are impressed, they hire you. Um, the idea of 3,000 Rand is out your mind completely now. Not so much. You're still there. Yeah, you I mean, accumulate capital. Maybe it's not three thousand anymore. At that point, I was not focused so much on money. I was a scholar at that time, so I was focused really, on learning. Yeah, I was learning, sharpening my skills. I was nerdy about computer graphics at yeah. the time, and then also reading a lot of books and stuff like that. You don't know where you get that curiosity from. I've always been like this, but it's just that before that, I was in an environment where that that type of personality or curiosity is not ter tolerated. Yeah. If you grow up in black neighborhoods, you know what it's like, even at a nation, at a national level. Yeah. We're not really good at embracing uh, people who are different or who have just good minds. Yeah, it's curious and who ask questions. You know yeah. how many parents are annoyed by kids that keep asking why? Yeah. Why is that? What does it do? You're like, ah, just keep quiet. Absolutely. And then for kids like me and you who have a curious mind, the for me at least, stumbling upon a library mm. is mind-blowing like this place has got all the answers i'm looking for mm -hmm. fast forward to the future where there's google mm. there's the internet yeah and you can travel and meet the person that built the thing and you're like i i'm like a kid in a in a candy store yeah and it's sad that a lot of environments whether it's your family your home whether it's your community whether it's your company they don't allow for conducive environments for a, a curious child and i wish at least for myself and people like you, that every parent's like, my kids got a million questions, please take them. And you're like, we love kids like this because these are the kids that are going to solve problems. Yeah. So yeah, man. Anyways, please continue with the story. Well, so you're, you're trying to, you're learning. Yeah. You're not on the 3000, but you're, you're learning. What happens to your journey from there after Wicked Pixels? Yeah, so there I started now, uh, I learned a little bit about the city because doing the internships allowed me to get out of Delft a little bit and being able to go in the city, yeah. right? So I started becoming comfortable. With the rich white people live. Well, exactly, Cape Town. right, with, with Cape Town. And uh, the, I mean, look, I like cities, right? Just the energy, the hustle. Uh, growing up when you're watching uh, Isidingo and they have that shot of Johannesburg of cars moving around, <laughs> you're like, the city is where it's ha it happens, right? You know that it doesn't happen in the township, yeah. for real. So I started going into the city. I would move around and meet some people out there. 
And I started finding some side hustles of some artists in Cape Town or, you know, low level work, but I'd be able to do things for them and make a little bit of money. Or I would also get some side gigs in the city yeah. because now I knew some, I knew uh, a few people. No more gardening, cutting grass? At that point, no more. Okay. Yeah. So. Do you remember how much you were making on average per month? Uh, look, it w- it wouldn't be more than three thousand. Three thousand. Because all I w- was worried about is just have enough transport to go into the city. That was my all my right. grind. At that Still point. living with your dad. Yeah. Okay. Still in Delf, but I just had to make enough money to be able to go into the city. And y- you know, when you're meeting people with opportunities, you have to lie where you live. <laughs> so I had to pretend that I'm staying somewhere closer to town. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, they won't give you the opportunity because they're like, it's too far. Rather not. Exactly. Yeah. But then I also learned camera work at a church that I used to go to in Goodwood. So we would now, there are a few people who would take me with to go and film for them weddings and stuff like that and would make a little bit of money, uh, a little bit of cash through that. But um, we started a, a little company with a friend of mine from Goodwood as well of filming and stuff like that. So I remember because the guy who used to give me piece work to film at wed- weddings, he used to think that I live in Goodwood. That's what I told him. <laughs> yeah. So he would get me, he would drive me and leave me at a building <laughs> that I don't even live in because that's where I told him that I live. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have to find a taxi from Goodwood into Delft. Yeah. Because if you told them that, oh, I live in Delft, you'd probably be like, I don't want anything to do with you. Sure. So that, it was things like that. But after that, bro, I, I just started now hustling and then i remember i would work at some studio or some other guy's house Mm. helping help him to render something because he couldn't figure it out himself and i'll finish at 10 10 p.m and then now i have to take a taxi from cape town cbd into delft are the taxis at 10 even at 12 yeah so at 10 so the thing is you finish at 10 you have to wait into the taxi until it fills up yeah. from all the workers who are working in the waterfront or some Oh, the, some late, the late night workers, I get yeah. you. So you pay a little bit extra because it was able to drop you outside your house. Because Shout you know, out to the taxi industry, man. Shout out to the tech. Like, we yeah. give it a lot of hell because the guys drive crap and the taxis are. Yeah. But for the F, for the value that they add to so many people's lives. Yeah, you have no idea. A little idea. bit of extra money, but look, you'll get home. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's, it, and it's still within... Um, you know, considerable amounts to be mm. fair, right? They're dropping you right at home because if you're in Delft and they drop you by the bus station, you're not going to make it home safe. Yeah. That's just 100%. And shout out to churches. Sorry, I wanted to say so many kids speaking, uh, reading and writing, learning how to play instruments. Yeah. A lot of the kids, and I've met a lot of people also in the film industry who started off by filming church services and stuff. So yeah. shout out to the churches that actually put kids on in terms of skills. Yeah. Yeah. And then eventually I got into the online stuff because also in the on the ground, I couldn't really get hired because I still didn't have the, the, certificate. the certificates. Oh. So if I look at a job post, they would still, that, oh, we want someone with a degree in this and this and graphic design or whatever um, qualifications they need. I didn't have it. Yeah. So I had to find a way around it. So it was either to work in spaces that are not directly linked to what I'm interested in mm-hmm or to just go online because online nobody asks you those questions yeah. they just want the job done exactly right so i went online i was i became a reddit buff just spending more time on reddit um what's I, reddit i don't use reddit but i know a lot of people speak about it what's reddit reddit is like the only real internet where it's not it's the opposite of twitter imagine an environment where you can um discuss things yeah. it's a chat room and it's very isolated. Like if you're into cars, there's a subreddit for people who like cars and those specific cars. Yeah. If you're a camera nerd, you're going to find subreddits that are all about cameras. If you're into 3D animation, if you're into physics, like you find all these chat rooms that are really professional and people are really nerdy about whatever they do. Is it like curated WhatsApp groups on the internet? Absolutely. It's okay. on, it's on, it was founded by Alexis Ohanian, who is the husband of Serena Williams, by the way. Really? Exactly. Hectic. Yeah, it's big. Okay, so you started living on Reddit. I started I living must, on Reddit. I must Reddit. visit Reddit. A lot of people have recommended it to me, but I must N- go N- visit. Now it's not so cool. It became woke and all this kind of thing. It's not a safe space that it used to be anymore. <laughs> it became woke. Yeah. Woke has become a trigger word. Sorry. Yeah, back then it was kind of dirty. You could say whatever you want. Nobody gives a shit. Right? Okay. 
Yeah, so I met a few friends on there on Reddit, and then they started giving me some piece work to do for them. They were trying to set up their new Reddit pages at the same time. Yeah. And eventually I came across this subreddit where um, there's an AMA on, AMA actually started on Reddit, which means ask me anything. A popular person would go there and say, hey, my name is Bill Gates. You can ask me anything. Hey. And on one of the AMAs, people were asking Bill Gates about Bitcoin. And they were asking Bill Gates. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out, this was on Reddit and it was Bill Gates. Yes. There was, um, was it called Spaces? What was that thing? There was this app that got popular, I, I think around COVID lockdown, mm. where people like Elon Musk and them would get on. To Clubhouse. This, it was Clubhouse. Mm. Yeah. Something similar to that? Something similar to that, Twitter yes. Spaces, but, I'm but, here, yeah. I'm Bill Gates. Yeah. Ask me anything. Yeah, but it wasn't voice. It was obviously read. Reddit is only right. That's dope. Yeah. Sorry, I'm listening. Yeah, so AMA. people were asking Bill Gates about Bitcoin and... I got interested in that. I was like, wow, you know, Bitcoin. I've been hearing about these things since I was spending quite an, uh, enough time on the Do internet. Do you remember the year? This was 2015. 2015. I think We're so. We're in 2023 now. Yeah. Because for, for most of your fans, unfortunately, mm-hmm. this is where they're going to start paying attention the most because this is what they want to hear. <laughs> right. So you're on Reddit. Yes. Someone asks Paul Gates about Bitcoin. Yeah, it, it was 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. Okay. I think this it's still there. I, I have a link to that subreddit still. So. Game, um, game changer for you? Yeah, big day. Big day to me. Like that was... That was you finding gold somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. And then people ask him about Bitcoin and it was like, ah, Bitcoin is great, but, 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 but. But I was like, what is this Bitcoin thing, right? And I thought it was just a website where you sign up and uh, you, you join the, whatever the Bitcoin was. So after that AMA, I ended up creating a Bitcoin. Uh, a Bitcoin. I went to Bitcoin.com. And I figured out a way to get me some Bitcoin the next the next two days after that, which I lost those Bitcoins. Why did I, you get Bitcoin? Well, just because, interest and in, yeah, it was it, it, about it. It was just interest, yeah. And then I went into all these Bitcoin subreddits. These people were talking about it, but they were talking about it from a political standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I didn't give a shit about the political. <laughs> so I still don't. So that was a little off-putting for me. Yeah. Right. So I bought the Bitcoin. It was interesting from a technical perspective because what it was saying when I read it was like saying, well, it means that you can no longer copy and paste data on your computer. It can only be transferred. Now, imagine someone saying Any data or specific to Bitcoin? Bitcoin. That's what it means. It means that. So imagine somebody telling you in 2012, say that, look, I, there's this technology right now that doesn't allow you to bootleg a song to copy it to your computer. If you have to take this song from my phone or from my computer, I can only transfer it to you. Or if and then I sh- you don't have it anymore, I have it. Exactly. Or, That's what the technology was. Exactly. Or we have to split it. And me being in computers at the time, I was like, that just doesn't make sense. It wouldn't work. Yeah. I just didn't believe that it's real. So I wanted to see that if it really hey, works. Sorry, I was going to ask a question, but maybe you'll cover it. Right. But I'll put a, a, a footnote. I wanted to ask if you ever tried, you never said anything about hacking, hmm. but I was going to ask if you ever tried hacking Bitcoin to actually see if this thing is, can actually, because you're saying you were, uh, you were like, nah, this, I don't really believe. Hmm. And if you're like, I know something about computers. I want to see if I can write a code to try and copy because you come from a background of piracy hmm. and, but I'll put it as a footnote. That's exactly what I was uh, I was thinking. I was like, maybe there's a way to actually find, to just make more Bitcoin yeah. or something like that. That's what I was thinking. I was yeah. like, there's we no make, way. We make fake money. We print fake money. Like I can obviously, and it's on the internet. I don't even need paper. Yeah. So I ended up realizing that it's actually real, right? But I didn't see the practical application of it yeah. until a little bit later. Uh, when people online couldn't pay me, when they want to hire me, but they're like, how do we pay you? PayPal, or they mention all these Western money apps that they use, right? Yeah. The remittance services. And I'm like, no, I don't have any of those. And PayPal at the time in South Africa wasn't even working. Yeah. It still doesn't work here in a way. It works, but it's not popular or it's not as popular as it should be. Well, it's, and, and it's linked, sorry, to F&B. Currently. Exactly. Yeah. It, it so practically it doesn't work. Doesn't work. It practically doesn't. doesn't. If, someone you in, to F&B. if you're in Soweto right now, you have a Capitec bank account, you can't use PayPal in a practical sense. I hear you. You know, in that sense, I fully agree. Yeah. So it didn't work for me until one guy said, "Oh, you know, what about I just pay you in Bitcoin?" I was like, 
Bitcoin. Oh, that that Bitcoin that I yeah. I got from Reddit. Yeah. And then that's when I started now looking into it. I was like, oh, actually, it's almost like having a a bank account, a Swiss bank account for that for that matter, without going through the hoops of the banks and. Why would you say Swiss bank account for that matter? What's unique about Swiss bank accounts? All the rich people have Swiss bank accounts. Why? Uh, because. A Swiss bank account, it means that you have this sort of account that's protected. Nobody can actually mess with it easily. Mm. Not your government, not your neighbors, not mm. anyone. Um, you can have a bank account in a fake name if you want to. And nobody in would Switzerland? Actually, yeah, yeah, of course. That's dope. I mean, why do people bank in Switzerland? It's because of the secrecy. Exactly. Because they can launder money, these bastards. Or you can call it that. You can say they can ah, launder money. It's a lot of scandals, man. But the... the my understanding of the laws around Swiss bank accounts is exactly what you're saying, that it's like a vault that no one can access mm -hmm. and it allows protection on your money, how you move it. And, and, and it basically allows you to be in control of your money more than you would in other countries. Yeah. And I know a lot of people think badly about Swiss bank account. This sounds shady. But if you're a Chinese or a Russian rich guy mm -hmm. and you have all your money in Russia or China, bro, like good luck taking it out. You can't. Yeah. So having a Swiss account at least means that you have some form of structure that allows you to move. It's your money at the end of the day, right? So Bitcoin means that meant that to me because when I try to get a bank account, they ask me, are you a student? No. Uh, do you have a pay slip? Do you have a job? Mm. No. Therefore, we can't open a bank account for you. I don't know if that's still the case. Is that an op oh, I was going to ask if that's an opportunity because I don't know if it's, it's the case. I wouldn't know, but it's, mm. it's something worth exploring that... If you're a foreigner, how do you transact? Uh, do you need a student permit? Do you need a work permit? Is there a workaround? Any permit, practically, you can get a bank account. Yeah. But when you have to, I don't know if that's still the case now, but back then, you either had to have a job or you had to be a student to open a student account. Okay. I wasn't, I wasn't a student yeah. at all, like in the formal sense. Yeah. So there's no way that I could get an account from NetBank. Do you know... Do you know how to explain PayPal? PayPal? Yeah. Like? What, what it is and how it oh, works. Oh, yeah. So PayPal is basically an online money remittance service. It allows you to transfer money online mm. from one person to another using an email address. So it's almost like having a bank account, yeah. but it's easier to get one because all you need to do practically is to have an email address. If you have an email, you create a PayPal account, you can connect this PayPal account to your bank account. Mm. Therefore, you can send money around the world using PayPal. If you want to withdraw it into your bank account, you can. Yeah. It also has um, an API that allows you to collect money. So if you have an online store, you can allow people to pay you with PayPal. It's a game changer. It's big for. It's basically the gateway to e-commerce. It used to be. Now it's Stripe, but yeah. PayPal was like the it thing for people who were trying to do things online. I remember listening to Peter Thiel because Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Reid Hoffman, all these guys were there yeah. building PayPal. And one of the things they emphasized, which I think a lot of the tech computer guys understand, is try and simplify whatever idea. And yeah. if you're solving a problem, try and find the simplest, most direct way. And they said they hit the jackpot when they found a way to link money and your email, mm -hmm. which is what PayPal is. And to this day, I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's shady. I wonder if, because it, it breaks, it almost breaks a lot of what we know as money banking laws mm -hmm. because people send you money with your email address yeah. and you almost don't have to show anything except in South Africa, you need the FNB account. And I guess the risk is mitigated because FNB is meant to do all the FICA, KY, I, KYC, KYC, know your customer, yeah, those type of things. But it was literally like, if you have an email address, I will send you money, boy. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy. Okay. Um, before you carry on with your story with Bitcoin and the people that were paying you, what is Bitcoin and what are cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so Bitcoin is an alternative form of money and system. It means that it's money that's not controlled by the government or a company. It's not controlled by FNB. It's not controlled by the South African Reserve Bank. It's not controlled by America. It's controlled by people who use it, who see a benefit by supporting this network. So it's basically like a, an open source tool that can be used mm. as money 
or a store of value, but the same can also be used to transfer money. So it's both a currency and a network for transacting. So you're using the word money and mm. we understand money as coins, as notes. Today, mm. some of us as plastic cards. Is, is Bitcoin that in virtual form or is it something else? Is it like a code? Is it numbers? Is it what Neo was seeing in the matrix? These green, th like what is a cryptocurrency in, in real, in real technical terms? Okay. It's basically a spreadsheet or you can say a ledger. Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a spreadsheet. Yes. Okay. It's a ledger for storing data and accounting for it. Your mom, we're going back to your mom now. Yes. Your mom's book. It's my, mom, my mom's it's book. your mom's book of writing things down. Exactly. And it's exactly what money is. It's basically just a record. It's record keeping yeah. of value, right? You had two Bitcoins. Therefore, after that, you sent it to this person. Yeah. This person sent it over here. And this happens in an encrypted way, encrypted format. And there there's a process of validating the network on who decides to write into this book, into this spreadsheet. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So there are people who sort of involve themselves in the process of the record keeping and we call them <coughs> miners, right? Because for you to have the rights to write in that book, mm. your transaction has to go through a mining process. The difference is with F and B, if I send you a transaction. Yeah. I can call them and say, I made a mistake. Could you reverse the transaction? F and B have that power to just change the book, the ledger. Okay. Right? In Bitcoin, you cannot be able to do that because there's nobody really who controls it. So there's no one who you can call and say, oh, this, I made a transaction mistake here. Please reverse it. It can't be reversed. It cannot be reversed. Just like if you... If you miss your appointment by five minutes, mm. there's no way you can make that five minutes back. back. Exactly. Who founded Bitcoin? It's under the name Satoshi Nakamoto. I like how you said that. It's under the name. Yes. You're not saying it's a... It's not a person. We, we What's don't the name, know. sorry? Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi Nakamoto. Yes. You're not saying it's, a, it's Satoshi Nakamoto. You're saying it's under the name. Yes, it's under the name. So it's, it's a moniker. So nobody really knows whether it's a group or it's one person. We, we do know people who were involved in the process, uh, Adam Back and a couple of other guys, but the main founder of it mm. is still unknown. You know, I've always thought George Orwell, who wrote Animal Farm in 1984, I've mm. thought William Shakespeare and arguably Leonardo da Vinci, these were groups mm. like your boys, the Delft Band. Yes. You know, and then you become the face but there's actually an entire group of people working in the background and you're just, because Apple is Steve Jobs, but he obviously wasn't working alone. And a yeah. hundred, a thousand years from now, they'll be like, Steve Jobs was creating this tech. You're like, he wasn't creating anything. He was just there pitching. Yeah. I, I feel like those guys did that. Do you feel like Bitcoin currently, so far in the journey of your life has been your calling, your, your lottery ticket, your everything in my life has led me to this point to discover this thing? Not really. It's just a means to an end. For someone with my circumstances, or a lot of people like me who are watching right now, they might not realize it, but Bitcoin is the greatest thing that ever happened to us, especially Africans. That ever happened? That ever happened to us. So I, I'm, I'm stuck on this word happened because it's mm. a past tense word. Yes. It sounds like you're saying Bitcoin is potentially the greatest thing that can happen to Africans if they embrace they it. They embrace it. Absolutely. Yes. Why would you say that? I see your guy, Rutendo. He, Rutendo Matinyarare. Yes. So he, he hates sanctions. Yeah. And he's on the rant about sanctions and all of that. But what he's doing technically is going out and crying about crying to the West, saying, oh, you kicked us out of this system. Please accept us back. We want to be part of the banking system. And now we have this new network <laughs> that is free of charge that nobody can sanction us on. It's just that we don't embrace it. So if Zimbabwe was to embrace cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, they wouldn't need to beg anyone, anyone to be involved in global transactions. 100%. They can make a deal with Russia and say, look, we will be settling our transaction in Bitcoin. Yeah. 
and then they'll be getting paid in Bitcoin. They don't have to ask anyone. Nobody can sanction them. And then after that, they can sell the Bitcoins if they want to for US dollars, wherever they want. Yeah. Right. So it's a new financial layer or as in as disintegrated Africa is. Right. It's mm -hmm. very difficult. Like this huge continent with multiple currencies. It's crazy. Yeah. If we decide to create one currency, we wouldn't have to create one from scratch. There are now networks like Bitcoin that are free of charge, mm -hmm. more transparent. We can just plug and play. Yeah. And we wouldn't have to ask the West or anyone for anybody. And the, th the thing is, it will be different from all the other system because it's already fully integrated with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a power tool. It just needs to be embraced for someone who understands it. Before I get skeptical, because you know I'm skeptical yeah. about cryptocurrencies in general, um, please can you explain what mining mm -hmm. Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, what does that entail? What does it mean? Okay, good question. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. The technical stuff is not that, in, that impressive. I mean, what, it is what, very what, impressive. What would you prefer, simple or technical? I think simple for everyone, because if you get technical, people lose interest, right? Okay. So the technical explanation is that, look, it's encryption. And a computer goes through a process of decrypting certain data or it gets a mathematical equation to get the right to write into the ledger. It's a test for your computer. Yes. To say that it is good enough. Yes. To validate other transactions. N not, not good enough if it's about truth. So the computer is trying to validate the truth of this transaction. If your bit, the bitcoins you're trying to, to, to send, it will look into the entire history of where they were sourced where they're at now, and if the amount is true and where you're sending, after you send, you're really remaining with the right number. Okay, right? let's go simple now. Yeah, now let's what go. What is mining? So mining, like I said, Bitcoin is the ledger. It's a spreadsheet, okay. right? Now, if you want to make a change, Penuel has 100 Bitcoins. Yeah. He wants to send two Bitcoin to MACG. Yeah. What needs to happen there is that the ledger needs to be changed for this transaction to be conducted, right? Yeah. So who is going to, who has the right to write, to, to go into the spreadsheet and change the numbers? Remove uh, two from me, I'm yeah. left with 98, give yeah. two to MACG. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So in Bitcoin, in, in the traditional bank, you'd have FNB to do that or the reserve bank. Mm. In Bitcoin, there's no owner who controls the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is out there, everybody can see it. Yeah. Anyone who wants can see it for free. But for you to have the right to change something, 10, let's say 10 people have to agree that this transaction is true. Yeah. So your computer, my computer, someone else in China, someone else in America, they have to run, um, they have to run an algorithm mm -hmm. that will verify that this is true. And all of these 10 people from around the world do, do not know each other. They have to say, yes, Penuel actually has 100 Bitcoin. Yeah. He can spend two. So mining is basically validating a transaction. But whoever validates it first gets rewarded in Bitcoin. That's how Bitcoin I added into the supply. So if my computer was the first one to solve the, um, the computation yeah. and get it right, and I will, be, I will now have the right to basically inscribe into the data sheet and change the numbers. What's the story around um, crypto mining houses and com a lot of computers and supercomputers and chowing a lot of electricity. What's that about? So back then you could mine Bitcoin in your laptop. It used yeah. to work. But as the ledger is getting bigger and bigger, it needs a lot of computation power. Yeah, it's like servers. It's like the servers. The more data you have, you need. the more powerful the computer you need. Absolutely. Yes. Technology can only go so far. And they, there are things in nature that are bigger than technology. Mm -hmm. And nature will always if pushed, be stronger than human advancements. So human beings can only create so much. When, when, when a tsunami hits Giza, the permits will be fucked. Mm. Fuck you and your history and your... If the whale is going at a ship, oh, fuck bro. your ship and whatever geniuses you used. And for me, it's a very spiritual concept because I love nature. You know, as a, as a panelist, whenever I'm confused... You look to nature. I look to nature. Yes. Whenever I'm like homosexuality, okay. what you were saying about buck and lions, I fully ascribe to that. It's, I, I spent there a month, are people that were built to be, to serve uh, other people. I mean, it's yeah, it's 99% to one actually, yeah. if you think about it. Um, I, I learned this lesson the hard way. I was in along the Zambezi River between Zimbabwe and Zambia, 
there's an, an incredible place called it's, it's, it, there. It's called Time and Tide. Yeah. So I traveled there with my own Starlink. A friend of mine actually owns the joint. You traveled with your own Starlink. Starlink. What's that? They started I- I- Elon Musk Internet. I'm they, by the way, right? Oh. Uh, oh shit. Is this gonna be extra side? What what? Maybe. I mean. Anyways, it's, it's chill. It's chill. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> please please carry on. We'll, yeah. We'll see if we add it on or if we'll place it somewhere. Yeah. What's, so what's Starlink? Sorry. Starlink is satellite based internet yeah. by SpaceX. Sure. It basically you can connect. Inter- you can connect to the internet through satellite. So is all you it need- a modem? Is, no, no, it's like a, a, a dish, almost like DSTV, a small okay. device like this. Yeah, I'll show it to you. And then you can travel anywhere you want. As long as there's coverage, yeah. it works. So you can be in the most remote area. It means in your village now, yeah. they can have world-class internet access without cables, nothing. Like- is Starlink like VPN? No, bro. It's it's what I mean by like VPN. It's it doesn't matter where you are. You connect to a satellite regardless. Yes. So you don't need permission in South Africa to use Starlink. It were there is coverage in South Africa, but Starlink as the company has not been licensed in South Africa because of the politics here. But you have coverage. But you have coverage. So if What's you have the, the difference, uh, licensed means Starlink is allowed to sell their devices here and operate. Coverage. So you can't buy the devices. You can't buy them here. Yes. You can't. You can't. But you can use it here. You, but you can use it. Oh, here. So it's almost like bit, it's, it's almost like Bitcoin. You That's can ban import, it. Export. That's what your mom's <laughs> business. That's go fetch the Starlink and sell it here. As a no, it's an imported product. Yeah, it's part of my business now in Zambia because in Zambia they, uh, it's licensed there, right? So yeah. I'm I'm trading them. That's fucking dope. Yeah, but it's crazy to think that time, you know time and tide. No, yeah, that was just a, a place. It's a it's a beautiful oh. place you should visit. Time and tide is. Um, um, is along the Zambezi River. We'll speak about nature and lions and parks. Yeah, so it's basically, you're literally on the edge of Zambezi River. You've got hippos, uh, elephants walking around. Yeah. You pay like $400 a night. It's it's costly, but it's worth it. If you want to have like a, a spiritual experience yeah. or if I had to have a honeymoon ever, I would go to a place like that. So, Bro, like you wake you wake up in the morning, you step out of your tent, you got animals passing through, and you see all the back. And when there's a lion coming even a kilometer away, you know it. Because the um the monkeys are screaming, the whistling or something like that. <laughs> all the animals know and they just they just start moving. So the an- other animals may be cool, but the back, even when there's no threat, they're always looking. Paranoid. They're always paranoid, bro. Paranoia. Just, exactly. Except how gangster is a lion roar? Like a person that's never heard a lion roar, because it took me the first time I heard a lion roar was at the Pretoria Zoo, mm. and they weren't roaring out, they were grumbling, mm. and I was like, "What's that?" And I was like, "This is the hype." I don't know how the hell their vocal cords work. Mm-hmm. I was actually listening to a, a Pastor Rhymes clip. Pastor's voice is so amazing. A lion roar, if you've never heard it. Sounds like a cool thing until you hear it, and then it sounds unreal. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. Christopher Nolan IMAX what what that can. It's only it's only like um, a rhino that, that just doesn't give a, a shit about a lion. We love people like this, like the hyenas. The yeah. hyenas also, you know, the Lion King. Going back to the Lion King, the Lion King. I've never it. watched it, by the way, but please watch it mm-hmm. just for completeness and for context. Yes, um, the hyenas were sold a, a disservice. It's like the snake in the Bible. Snakes are not evil animals. Snakes are not evil. When you see a snake, it's not a demonic. Mm. The Lion King painted hyenas as these dirty, I'm a para in South Africa, these dirty scrum. Hyenas are fucking gangster animals and they do not fear lions. Mufasa might come and growl, but hyenas are like, bro, we might move a bit back, but we're here. I don't so a rhino I don't... and an elephant will kind of be like, hey, bro, hey, you know if I actually step on you, you're fucked, so watch yourself. <laughs> I don't like hyenas too. I mean, why not? They're cowards. They're almost like, they're almost like. I was gonna say something so racist. Crocodiles, bro. Like they crocodiles always, are cowards. Yeah, of course, bro. Like they waiting for you to just walk in. They they will never really attack you in a one to one directness. Run of, uh, offensive. Right. They go on the defensive and uh, okay. exactly. So they're waiting for you to be passing through, and then they grapple you into the water, and they definitely attack someone who probably is not good with the water and then ah, they defeat yeah. you they, they, they will never sneaky. do that to the rhino to, i mean to the uh, to the hippo 
They just you're don't saying hyenas are sneaky. They won't hit you up front. They'll yes. come grab you from the back while you're yeah. not looking. And yeah. yeah, I'll make the reference, and I apologize. It's maybe a bit racist and stereotypical. A lot of people that have been in fights with colored gents, mm. they'll be in a club and they'll moor a colored gent, and then the colored guy will leave and then come back with the gents, and then they'll fucking kutsa for you in a corner, and you're like, ah, could have just faced me up front, you know, not what you're doing. Anyways, going back to the conversation. I've seen a lot of these fights in Delft, by the way, so I, I'm aware of what you're saying. <laughs> I think Indians in Durban also do something similar, man. Like you, Mura O, and like it's you and the O. And then he has to come through with his bras, and ah, you're like, but that's. So the hyenas maybe do that. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I love the hyena as an animal. I mm-hmm. think it's underrepresented. Its jaw is fucking strong. And besides the weird laughing and the fact that the females have a penis, <laughs> <laughs> I think they dope animals. Uh, skeptical skepticism sure so I studied accounting become accounting economics doing the CA stream to become a chartered accountant I worked out yo, shout out to Ernst and Young they paid my fees I was supposed to go at PricewaterhouseCoopers they were a bit late a year late so I went with the guys that actually liked me auditing and accounting has been exposed for fraud mm-hmm. cooking the books and what you're saying about ledgers and validation and verification, there are people that are authorized, chartered accountant, an mm-hmm. auditor, registered accountant, registered auditor, who go and sign. And once great job basis signatures there, you're like, as an investor, I can trust this. Mm. But your KPMGs, Deloitte's, them too, the most. Obviously, we had Arthur Anderson with Enron. Uh, not so much maybe Pricewaterhouse and not so much Ernst & Young. But KPMG and Deloitte, so many scandals globally mm-hmm. where you realize, man, there's a lot of fraudulent accounting and fake shit. So my concern when you say ledger and verification is mm. some of these people that are authorizing may be dodgy. And it's, yes, you might mind. Yes, you get your validation. But I mean, you also go through a UCT, Vits, Rhodes, and you go through Psyker to become a CA. All of these things can be corrupted. Can these guys not be corrupted? This is not necessarily to speak generally about cryptos. It's just me asking you a personal question. Can I find the network of the 10 guys and be like, gents, let's all approve this transaction and we'll chow money together. Okay, that's a very good point. So I'll start with saying that when you talk about chartered accounting, CA, economics, it really sounds fancy, right? Yeah. Um, Most of it isn't at all. Because I used to think the same until I could afford to hire them. (laughs) Don't do that to to the CAs. They're going to get hurt. To be real. You know, so you mentioned, the reason I say this, when you mentioned KPMG and Deloitte and stuff, it really sounds like some important firms that are doing some crazy shit. But they're mostly Western companies that are enforced mostly in a lot of places that, okay, for us to take you seriously, you have to use these guys. Again, it goes back to that certificate thing. Right. If you don't have the certificate, we can't list you. We can't get big investors. But, but let's talk about accounting, what it is. It's basically mathematics, right? If it's math, then why do you think one firm is much more credible than the other? Because it's math. Then, then it's we're not, straightforward. Then we're not talking about math anymore at that point, right? So Bitcoin removes that. It's just pure maths. I if, want you to go back to what you said, bro, because that's like a mic drop moment. Okay. Like, if we're speaking numbers and ledgers and finance, it's mm. maths. Yes. And if it's just maths, why would you need anyone? Mm-hmm. And why would one firm be better than another one? Mm. Hectic. You know, I know the reason why. The reason is law, the biggest scam. Law is subjective. Right. So you always want people to manipulate it so you can manipulate the numbers by manipulating if you know how to manipulate, manipulate the law. Yeah. That's why someone can steal money and it went through the banks and then you still never be able to recover it. Hmm. That's how corruption works, yeah. because you use the law to basically not face the consequences. Jeez. And right. you're saying Bitcoin and other cryptos. You don't speak about other cryptos. It looks like you're just a Bitcoin activist or are you including all of them. Well, um, Bitcoin specifically. Cryptocurrencies can be created in different ways. They can be as flawed as the fiat currencies are as well, okay. right? But Bitcoin is the most resilient, is the oldest, cannot easily be corrupted, and it ha- it's the most decentralized. So you don't speak for cryptos? No. You speak for Bitcoin? I speak for Bitcoin. Okay, I just want to clarify that. I, I, I'm a trader, so I can trade anything to make money. I'll yeah. trade the rand, I'll trade the dollar, I'll trade the 
any other coin. Yeah. I don't care. Uh, like Jesus has a good line. He says, I'm all about dead presidents. I don't give a fuck how they died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> exactly. So it's a, it, so I trade anything to make more Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the real, um, I think it's the best best form of money that we have to in, uh, in this day right now. Sure. So you were saying that Bitcoin removes that thing that audit firms and yes. those things do. How, how do they do that? Bitcoin is law and accounting at once. Okay. Right. The laws are here. You know them. You break the law, you break the rules, you get kicked out of the network. Okay. Right. And everything that happens is transparent. Everybody is able to see it. So it's very difficult for you to manipulate a system that's transparent. The corruption you're talking about in the KPMGs and all these auditing firms, it's simply because they operate in secrecy. Yeah, right? that is true. Exactly. Tenders operate in secrecy. Correct. That's why you can manipulate them. If everything was exposed, there would be almost no corruption. Yeah. Right? So who are you going to corrupt in Bitcoin when you can also become a miner? Mm. So we, all of us in this room, we can decide to become Bitcoin miners. Mm. Right now, if you want to manipulate the Bitcoin network, you have to corrupt 51% of the network. We call it the 51% attack. Yeah, that would give you the punity to basically reverse a transaction or to do something malicious. Yeah. But then it would be more expensive than the money you would make. So let's say you're trying to reverse a billion dollar transaction. Yeah, then you have to spend 60, 60 billion dollars. The the cost of corrupting the system in Bitcoin is more expensive than just Abiding absolutely, by the rules. absolutely. It's like driving. I so hear that. the best laws in nature or in the world are the ones that are not based on enforcement necessarily. It's based it, on consequences. It's based on consequences, right? You don't drive nicely and accept and obey all the rules because you're a nice person. Yeah. It's simply because you do something stupid, you hit the next guy, you die too. Okay. Yeah. So the game theory is much better designed than the traditional. I like this. This system. is the first answer that gives me happiness that you're saying the cost of corrupting the network is more expensive. Yes. Than the making of the money. Yes. My next bit of skepticism, uh, which I've raised is the linkage to fiat currency. Mm -hmm. So obviously, maybe not obviously, if you don't mind, if you could give us, a, it's up to you, I can do it, a brief summary of the history of money mm -hmm. um, from bartering to fiat currency before we get to cryptos. So money has been in different formats, right? Um, first, it was obviously barter trade because it's the most basic form of trade we can do. You exchanging have exchanging goods and services. Exchanging goods and services. Yeah. And as humans evolve, governments grow and centralization sort of, or we find more effective ways to trade. Yeah. We introduce different kinds of things and we find items that are more rare and we use them as money. It can yeah. be shells, it can be a rock, and then eventually it was gold. We moved from the gold standard, we moved into paper. Yeah. Um, there was a, a time where having a hundred dollars meant that you have let's say an ounce of gold yeah. and you can be able to redeem gold with that hundred dollars. Yeah. So m the paper money that we have used to just be like a letter from the king or the chief to say that this guy, Penny will have two bullions of gold in my garage. Yeah. And if any time uh, he can come and claim it. Yeah. But because the, the US came into play, they realized that you can't really manipulate a system like that. If you want to fund wars and any other adventure that you want to be on, it's very difficult to use real money because then- It is more transparent. Not only transparent, it's more difficult. Let's say you, you want to fund the Ukraine war and it's going to take you 300 kilograms, 300,000 kilograms of gold. Yeah. If you're America, you don't have that much gold. The only way to do it is to basically buy that gold in exchange for something, you know, with Africans. <laughs> but if you remove the gold standard, you can just print the money for free. <laughs> I think it may have been Edward Snowden. I'm not sure. Whistleblower for the CIA. Yeah. Who said that um, Bitcoin is virtual gold. It Would is you exactly agree with, with that? 100%. The mining that you talk about is what we call proof of work. Yeah. You have to work to get it. Just like uh, just like the 
uh, the gold. You can't just get gold out of anywhere. It's a very expensive endeavor to yeah. dig gold. You invest time, resources to get it. Bitcoin is exactly the same. You buy powerful computers, electricity, and you burn a lot of energy just to do it. I wanted to say this earlier as well. Elon Musk once tweeted that um, there's no value in money. Money is valueless. The real value lies in goods and services, and money is just meant to account for that exchange. And he made this analogy to someone he was responding to saying, I put you on an isolated island. You can choose to either have a billion dollars or goods and services. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it's a no brainer. Yeah. So the money is just meant to account the accounting and the ledger aspect for the goods and services. Unfortunately, and this is why I'm skeptical of money and fiat, mm. it's been corrupted by the paper aspect where there was gold. It was pretty clear. I've got a bottle of water. Yeah. You've got that and we exchanged. It was Today, goods and services. I can decide with paper money that the money I have, I can multiply times 10. Now I can take 10 times what you had to build in real time. And I think it's one of the biggest scams, specifically of poorer nations like Africa, where the people that manage the money aspect, they will come and take your real value and they will define for you what it's worth. And then as soon as it gets into their possession, the value changes. And we have bought into that psychological idea. You get a Chinese sweatshop worker, sews a Louis Vuitton jersey, gets paid a dollar for that. As soon as it gets into the Louis Vuitton offices, it is now worth $300. Yeah. But it is the same material. It's just the person who told you the story. Yeah, anyway, so fiat currency is today is paper money yeah. that is decided mostly by, you're saying, the West or the US. Yeah. I mean, we dominate it with the dollar. That's why we worry about what the rand is to the dollar. Yeah. But the dollar is printed. And it's very challenging for a lot of people to understand Bitcoin and what it really represents and what it's trying to solve because they're married to this idea that the dollar is the money. That's my issue, right? right. My issue is why is Bitcoin denominated in dollars? Oh, because it means if the dollar fluctuates, my Bitcoin, the value fluctuates when I want to transact goods and services. Well, well, just think of Bitcoin as any other commodity. It will always fluctuate to the dollar. But what matters is which direction does it fluctuate to? So if you're gaining more dollars into the system, or let's say over time, does Bitcoin lose value to the dollar or does it gain? You can ask that with oil. You can ask, ask that for gold or any other cattle commodity. Cattle in Africa. Yes. Does, it, does the price of cattle in rand or dollars, mm. does it increase over time or does it, does it decrease? Can we agree that the dollar is corrupted? Of course it is, by design. But if it's linked to the Bitcoin... It's not linked. No, in, in, in the sense of getting goods and services, the things you actually want. Because mm. Bitcoin, like you said, is just a store of value and it's for transacting. Mm -hmm. And I want to buy cows. Mm -hmm. But now they're subject to this dollar that gets manipulated. Mm. Doesn't that mean, not necessarily that Bitcoin is corrupt, but that it's working within a corrupt system, which means it's, it's not much different from... Bitcoin could be the rand. Mm -hmm. But because the rand has to deal with the dollar, mm. it, it almost becomes a sucker of this external world influence. No, no but, but that is your reference point. So if you're in Turkey, you're looking at Bitcoin from a lira perspective, right? Okay. Because the mistake you're making in that argument is that you're, you're immediately equating money to purchasing, consumerism. Yes. But that's not the point. The point of money is worth accumulation. I should be worthy tomorrow than I was yesterday. Right. So if you work your whole life till you're 70 years old, how the fuck do you end up being broke when you have basically your energy was spent on working? Yes. And that's what fiat money does to you. Of course. Yeah. So it drains you of your life. Exactly. And so you with nothing but debt. You're, you're supposed to be accumulating value like you should have as you get older, you should have more purchasing power, more cows. More cow cows is a good example for me because they breed. So over yeah, time. Sure. Right. Perfect yeah. analogy. So if I spend 30, 35 years working on this earth and I'm spending my, I'm earning and I'm basically investing in cattle. Mm. By the time I'm 70, should I have 800 cows or I should have three? Mm. Right. So how is it OK when some, somebody retires? Now they have three cows. They have negative 50. They have, they have, they, exactly. Right. They owe 50 they cows owe 50 to the cows. state. It just doesn't the make fuck? sense. Yeah. So Bitcoin, you can look, you can reference it with any other commodity or form of money. But the whole idea is that it's designed 
to give you an advantage. It's designed in, a, uh, in, a, in an Austrian economics point of view, whereas it's something that gains over time, which is exactly what money is supposed to do. Okay, you didn't sell me with this one. I still have issues, but I'll I'll take. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're trying to say. It's like okay, look, I, this I, thing. I think you're you're almost saying Bitcoin is like cows. I think it's a commodity in itself, and you're meant to accumulate it over time. But my fear is no, that no, not you accumulate it over time, but like to, it should give you more tomorrow than you had before, in yeah. whatever format. So I can buy a house with Bitcoin. I don't have to go into the dollars. So, but, but what's the reference point? Yeah, but you are looking That's for... That's my concern. Uh, we can make a reference point in Bitcoin directly. So I offer services. There are certain services that I charge one Bitcoin for yeah. without any reference point. That's tricky for the next normal person. So it's like a cow. I'm yeah. like, I will trade you three cows. That's it. But then the person who wants my cows is thinking, I'm trying to buy a Mercedes Benz. And currently the cows are worth 100,000. Whereas I'm looking for a million. Hmm. So... That's, that's why my concern is the external world, because maybe we'll move into a virtual world at some point where we mm. get to define the value of things. And one Bitcoin can be a cow, or it can be a mansion, or it can be a bottle of water. Yeah. It's up to you. That now depends on how well you, we can sell each other a story. That's yes. the story of luxury goods for me. But for the average human being who is not smart, who's not technical, who's a sucker of psychology and marketing, mm. the reference point will be the lira or the rand or the... And if you're saying one Bitcoin, immediately they're like, oh, $10,000 or $3,000, which means I can have rent for. And that's what I'm saying. I struggle with that because I don't think. So I think Bitcoin has come a long way in making itself a currency. Initially, it was like a game, Monopoly money. Okay. That's why I'd give you 10 Bitcoin for fun. But it's become a, a thing now and people are transacting and businesses in real time are mm. accepting and trading in Bitcoin. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's at a point yet where it can completely de-link from other currencies in the world. Because once you get into the real world, oh, let me put it this way. I don't think there are online businesses that can fully replace, in my opinion, everything that's out there so we can only trade in Bitcoin and define. Gold is, the, is one of the oldest forms of money that we have. Yeah. How many South Africans own any gold? Do you, how many how many ounces of gold do you own personally? None, probably. So, it's exactly that. It's just because you you you're not using it doesn't negates the fact that it's still serving the purpose. It's people who pay attention to wealth creation and money who mm -hmm. probably accumulate a lot of gold. The rand and the dollar; these are only currencies that you should be using for consumerism. But okay. they're not the currencies you should be holding as I'm saving money in the bank of a hundred thousand rand in the bank. That's just crazy. Right? So I'll have, I'll have to think about what you're saying. Yeah, but you, you, you're, you're saying Bitcoin is good for wealth accumulation, which would tell me that I need to make as much, collect as much Bitcoin as I can. That's ex that's the point. And you, not use it to transact. You don't need to, exactly. Like why would you why would I be spending Bitcoins when that grow over over time? It has grown six thousand percent in the last six years. Why would I be spending that instead of spending the rand that is... But that 6,000% is based on the dollar. It, it, I'm basing it off the consumer uh, pricing index, right? Like you, you refer, you're you referring money as a tool for cons cons yeah. consuming things. Yeah. So what about gold then? What do you say about gold? Gold existed before the dollar. Mm. So what were we indexing it to? It, it can exist in its, in its vacuum without the reference to the dollar. Bitcoin is limited to a million coins. 21. 21 million coins. Yes. And it'll never grow. People have lost access to their Bitcoin. What happens to... I to lost the first Bitcoin I ever bought. How much? Do you know how much it's trading at right now? One Bitcoin is 29,150 the last time I checked. 29,000? Dollars, 150. That's 580,000 rand, roughly. Do you know the exchange rate? To the rand is 580,000 rand for one Bitcoin. 580,000 rand. Yeah. You lost that. I lost a few, yeah. So reckless. And they can't be um, found back in the ledger by the miners? No. To Look, say I, this is where it is. Yeah, I can, can get it You can it. see the transaction. If I find the transaction ID, I could see that oh, these Bitcoins are still sitting there, right? I know some of them where they're sitting, but I can see them on chain, but I can't have access to them. Why not? I lost the keys. I lost the... Um, Shouldn't the, there be an override if they know it's yours? Who knows? When you say when they know, who is they? Um, 
So I'm guessing Bitcoin probably uses, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know much about computers, but an IP address where you initially received it and there's a, trans you know, like we have- We like, call it a wallet. We have like verification, like when they call you and they're like, what's your name, mm. your address? When was the last time you loaded airtime on that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, can you not use a similar, because after a certain period of time, six months, a year, five years, mm. there should be like, these are Bitcoins that haven't moved at all. Mm. And at any given time, someone can challenge for them and say they're mine. I'd like to verify that they are mine. Okay. And then you have to track back and say, I last received them from Penn. Uh, he was paying me for an ad on the panel show. And, and they're like, okay. And the miners are like, we will send out to the network that there's someone trying to claim this Bitcoin. And if it's not yours, and if it can't be claimed within a year, we are giving it to this person because they tick boxes. So you can be a miner, but you don't have the key to move the coins, right? I, 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 the only one who has the keys or the coins, have the power to move them. What you're talking about is a custodianship problem. So Bitcoin as a commodity can be stored in different ways. I can store them in my private wallet on my phone mm. that I'm the only one who has access to that wallet. It's called a non-custodial wallet, just like cash. You can withdraw it from the bank, put it under your pillow. You're the only one who knows, yeah. right? Someone else can put it in the bank. Now, let's say both of you, you have lost your cash. Mm. The other person who put it in the bank have lost access to their bank account. The one with the bank account, they'll call the bank yeah. well, to you try lost to recover. Your bank card. Exactly, yeah. right? You who lost the cash, you lost it. You it's might hard. know that you lost the cash in Durban, but can you claim it back? Mm. No. Do you know how much Bitcoin is out there that people cannot access? Yeah, I think in the millions, I would say. Yeah. Out of 21 million? I would say, yes. I would say over a million Bitcoin. So Satoshi gave himself a million, uh, not gave himself, he mined one million coins yeah. that he kept to himself. That wallet is still there. Those Bitcoins have never been moved. We don't know if he's still alive or what his plan was or what, what strategies that he has with them. We can see them. They're already there. So practically, we have uh, 20 million that we can work with. And then out of the 20 million, 19 million has been mined and it's actively um, in circulation. Yeah. The 2 million still have to be mined. But then the supply of it halvens every about four years, which means the last Bitcoin is more likely to be mined in 2140, a long time from now. But, 2140, yes. the year 2140. Yes. Insane. And then uh, out, of the, uh, out of the current 19 million in circulation, we said 1 million is with Satoshi himself. I would say another half a million or more mm. um, frozen people are dead or the wallets will never be recovered. Have you seen a movie called In Time with Justin Timberlake? No. Please go check it out. It's, you know, there's these concept movies that really sh uh, shake me. Mm. It's the concept of time which most of us generally agree is finite and mm -hmm. we all have limited time and you're born with a certain amount of time. And as you trade, you give of your time yeah. and the wealthiest people in the world, they collect other people's time. time. So they get to live longer for a thousand years, etc. cetera. 100%. Uh, Bitcoin currently in the evolution of money and value capture is the thing maybe now. And I wonder moving forward, what that will move to, because to me personally, my value is number one in natural resources, water, the earth, food, but more importantly, uh, human beings and mm -hmm. human psychology. That's the thing I'm trying to mine. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I'm trying to hack because I believe if I can convince enough people of certain things, things like Bitcoin become worthless, mm -hmm. things like the dollar become worthless, things like cattle become worthless because I've hacked their minds. And the power of things like Bitcoin, crypto, fiat, has to do with the ability to convince people of story. Um, so that's my value, whatever whatever that means. That's why Bitcoin will never become a world currency of some sort. A world currency? It, it will never be like the big currency that's, I would, the mainstream currency, it will never. Why not? Simply because of what you just said right now. Most people who would need to use Bitcoin, can't use it because they don't think for themselves. They're waiting for Oof. someone to tell them something Jeez. else. So Bitcoin is for smart people. In a way, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> because look, it, it requires... The, the slow, stupid people must carry on with their dollars and their rents. Because it requires you to think for yourself and uh, see something different and embrace it, right? Just because it works for you. So I know you have thrown me a lot of arguments against Bitcoin, but it works for me, so I don't really care what you think. Yeah. 
you know? That's very important, by the way, in anything in life. Exactly, right? Where are these guys, they're waiting for the president to tell them. They'll tell them, oh, Bitcoin is, is not legalized. Okay? So you're waiting for someone to tell you that, okay, there's this important technology that can change your life. But first, I have to tell you to go and use it. It's almost like if you say, oh, but the internet has now been banned. Mm. Or a certain website should not be visited mm. because someone else says so. Yeah. Now, there are two different types of people. There are those who are going to listen. He said that we're, pe- we're penulates. We should never visit that website. Yeah. Then there are people like myself who would say, look, I don't give a shit. Fuck this penal guy and his penalism exactly. bullshit. I mean, I, I would be like, oh, I respect him for putting <laughs> it together, but I'm just not one of his like that, you know? Would you argue that Bitcoin is an elitist currency and that it's by design, I guess, uh, an exclusive club, almost arguably cultish? Not necessarily. I think it just appeals to a certain mindset of people. Like it's 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 quite a political in in a way that it's political in the sense that it's very liber- libertarian. People who identify as libertarians mm. would actually find more um, affinity with Bitcoin than others. Yeah. Or people who are trying to make money. Or if you're seeking freedom, I think Bitcoin is the best form of money you can have. Have you ever considered building your own crypto? I don't see the point. This is good enough for you. Yeah, yeah. I it's like, like finding the greatest school. You're like, I could build another school, but this school is pretty dope. Yeah, it's like inventing your own internet. I mean, yeah. do you want to go through that? Or you might as well just like, just like the example I was giving you before. A lot of African nations are really interested in creating their own currency. Mm-hmm. I'm like, look, good luck in convincing people with that to begin with and making it work. It takes a lot of work exactly. and money and time. Or you might as well just use something that works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 2014, 2015, Reddit, mm. Bill Gates. Yeah. We're in 2023 now. Yeah. The highlights of what getting into Bitcoin have done to your life as a boy from Lilongwe mm. in Malawi. If you can give us some highlights. Because you've become, at least in my opinion, we've had Forex guys. We had Sandy Leshezi here. Mm. The Forex guys, Sandy Leshezi, Jablaning Maobo Cashflow, mm. Prince NRP, maybe a couple of others. I don't know crypto celebrities, I think, except for you. You're my crypto celebrity. Like, what has crypto done for you? (laughs) Crypto has given me the level of education that I wouldn't have been able to get in any other way in the world anywhere. And most importantly, it it has given me the freedom to self-identify because without things like crypto, I would have to be like anyone else on the internet playing um, racial politics or party politics or some other dumb shit like that because you sort of have to identify with something while crypto has given me the freedom to control my own financial reality like I can be my own bank and actually take control of my life the way I see fit I can also partake in jurisdictional arbitrage because I'm using a currency that's more superior to yours. What's that? What's jurisdiction and arbitrage? Jurisdictional arbitrage is what you say that the one of the common businesses is trade, right? Uh, import exports. Um, shoes in South Africa are much more cheaper and they're high quality. Therefore, I would go to South Africa and sell them to Zim. You're taking advantage of places, the difference in places. Yeah. Jurisdiction is geography. Yes. Arbitrage is the difference in pricing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, okay. right? So it means that I have a superior currency that I can move anywhere I want with it, and it is in demand. You can go to places where people would see the rand and they won't even accept you to exchange it with theirs. They don't care. Most places, I think, when you travel outside of, I don't even know on the continent. I think the continent uses dollars. You see? But when you go to Asia, you're you're not going to trade the rand. Right. Bitcoin, however, there's a market for it everywhere. It's more in demand than the rand. Yeah. Right. So I'm using this currency that allows me to go anywhere in the world and I can be able to conduct in trade. I don't have to call the bank to ask them for permission for I'm moving to this country. Can you allow me to do it? People in Nigeria, they're only allowed to spend about sixty dollars on a credit card or something like that. People in Malawi are subject to like zero or maybe eighty dollars a month Jeez. on the credit card that they can spend of your own money. Right. Like, does that get crazier than that? So being in Bitcoin has exposed me to 
has given me a lot of advantage in that sense. And now I'm able to, I'm an international businessman now. I can operate in multiple countries mm. without lots of friction. Are you are you rich? Are you wealthy? No, I, I don't. I don't think so because it depends on what you think, right? So, in the places where I come from, people define being wealthy as being afford, affording to to buy BMWs and buying a car and some dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm from uh, DJ Spoo's school of thought. Like you know, yeah. I learned from people like him, so I know that the game is bigger than this, bro. Like. For you to, to to be considered wealthy, and I've met really wealthy people, it's a whole different game. I look at owning companies and having a really high net worth that is impactful at international level. Like I said before, you can think that you have made it because you own you, you bought a house in Santon and then you're driving a, a Mercedes Benz, mm. or you have a fancy watch and you go to Dubai like nobody gives a shit. So. You know, in the hood, I'm hood rich. In for someone in the hood, I'm rich to them because I can afford all the things that they respect. Are you Are you comfortable to discuss numbers? Sure. Really? Yeah. Be honest. What do you mean, discuss numbers? Your numbers. Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, it depends because I value my wealth in how many Bitcoin I have, right? and how much freedom I have. So it just depends. But I can say that I am comfortable enough to afford all the basic shit that people think it's being rich. And I know it's not rich. It's not wealthy at all. How many Bitcoin do you have? I don't know. Because, <laughs> true, because look, I have businesses and um, strategies and I trade every day. And yeah. whenever I make profit, I buy more Bitcoin every day. So do I know how much? You don't much? have to give us the number. Just give us like a... Maybe like over the, the honest the honest truth is that I really don't know Penua. I, when you are accumulating, when you you are accumulating uh, an item, I don't think it's a very. It's almost like asking me how many countries have you been to. I don't know. I'm not counting. That was part of the highlights I wanted to ask. The countries you've been to. Yeah, the I don't people count. You've met exactly. So it's the same. Uh, I mean, I've been to so many countries that much. I know, but do I know how many? I don't really care. Why They do you, go. Why do you travel? So I'll tell you a story. When I was young. In Malawi, I remember there was a day that my dad took the whole family on a trip, and the trip was at the air, to the airport yeah. just to see the planes, right? And I remember thinking that, wow, one day maybe I can, I will be one of the guys who actually goes. I, I remember looking at businessmen at the airport with a black briefcase walking into the plane, and then it, there it goes. And then it was like 4:30 p.m. British Airways landed at Kamuz International Airport in, in, in Lilongwe. Big plane, a lot of people coming off. And I was like, wow, one day maybe I'll be able to do that. So I've, I wanted to travel um, from that perspective because I just wanted to fly a lot. Because mm. uh, I, I, I wasn't doing it. So I remember when I made the, a little bit of money in South Africa, I booked myself a flight from Cape Town to Johannesburg and back <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> That's dope. <laughs> right? That was your first flight? That was my first flight. That's too dope. Yeah, with my own money, I'm really proud of it. Yeah. Um, so after that, I also realized through reading and starting to understand the world, like if you look at people who had impact, who impacted the world, who accumulated more wealth, this idea of subjecting themselves to one place is kind of like doesn't exist. They're It's explorers everywhere. and adventurers. Exactly. It's an, you were born on this planet. But the mistake that you make is that you're attached to this country. Then you hold it for your rest of your life and you live there. So I just wanted to break that. So when I started traveling, I started seeing more of the world. And then this identity thing that people struggle with, it started washing away from, from me uh, for a long time. And then I, I just became comfortable with not having a home and just being around the world. And I learned a lot through the process. And I also realized how good it is for business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the way I, the reason I travel is just exploration. I don't have any other good reason other than that. You're not religious, you're a minimalist. Yeah, so I also had a, a little history with religion. I grew up in a very religious family. Yeah. But when I asked questions about things, I was never been I was never answered at all. So I think I developed an animosity to religion because of that. Yeah. And as someone who is very much into physics and science. It gave me more fulfilling answers than religion. I just basically disregarded it. To to this day, I really don't, I don't care about it. Yeah. Yeah. Minimalism. 
Yeah, owning, many, owning cars, <clears throat> owning homes. I would like to own things that gives me power, not that removes power away from me. So I think owning things just for the sake of it is kind of stupid. Mm. But I get it that people do it. It can be for different reasons, insecurities or just not having. One thing that I did when I came out of poverty was to train myself to be like I've had money for a long time already. Right. So I think I defeated this whole consumerism thing. I do consume w- things. Wanting validation from other from people. other people. Yeah, exactly. Because right. you come from poverty. Right. Um, I worked so hard on that to the point that it doesn't face me anymore. Right. So I don't I'm not big into buying things that I don't need. You don't need the suit with the black briefcase. I don't need that. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, I look at it like if I look at that, for me, it looks like you're a slave in a way. It's, a, a it's almost like a, a slave uniform. Right. It's a clown uniform. I apologize to the suit wearers. But, exactly. You but, know yeah, you're, you're trying to. It's the certificate story. Yeah. You you want people to treat you based on how you're dressed and not maybe based on your content and yes. what you can do. Because when, when people know what you can do, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, mm. who the fuck cares what you're wearing? Yeah, but look, and this is a very important uh, thing to for people to understand, especially in, you, when you're in, in the township, right? We work so hard to sharpen how our presentation, simply because we don't want to be treated differently. But sometimes we work on the wrong thing, right? Like the most important thing you're ever going to have is your mind. Yeah. If you can be the shittiest person, in business we have this concept of salesmen. You can never fire the, the best salesman, even if they have the worst attitude. Like if you can deliver numbers as a salesman, nobody cares how you do it, yeah. right? So, yeah, I think when it comes to to, to concepts like that, it, I've met a lot of wealthy people. The wealthier they are, the more they're just in their flip flops and shit. <laughs> for for me, that's what I consider freedom. Yeah. But if you're on the come up, you're looking for validation. Basically, you look at the guy in a suit as being the yeah. yeah. But it's the other way around. Like the president kind of has to wear a suit all day. Yeah. I don't think I want to do that. Um, your concept of giving back mentorship, allowing mm. other potential curious kids who want freedom, do you feel a responsibility to go and find young great Chabesis from South Africa, Malawi, around the continent, around the world, and be like, I found this thing. It may not work for you, because fuck, penal, skeptical. But this worked for me and maybe I can put you on. Do you believe in stuff like that? Or are you just living for yourself? I do it all the time, right? I'm a very practical person. So I have people who were working for me in 2019. Now they're working for themselves, doing similar things that I was doing. Uh, they driving BMWs. They visit me in Dubai and stuff like that. I have people in South Africa, in Malawi, in Rwanda, everywhere. Mm. It's great. But my, the, big, the bigger thing that I want to do in that is to start my own school that will have an alternative version of education that's more practical. Yeah. So Peter Thiel has this fund called the Thiel Fund, where he invests in brilliant minds to drop out of school to go explore and start companies and stuff like that. They can always come back if they fail, but most of them just never do because they succeed, because they're smart yeah. and they're hardworking and they'll be fine. So I grew up around geniuses that I know. Right. Even Delft, like I've seen so many brilliant people yeah. that, who just never had the pathway that yeah. if somebody would was just able to step in with ten thousand dollars a year to allocate to them, they would achieve That's incredible so things. Yeah, exactly. The Teal Foundation. The Teal it's called the Teal Fund. Yeah. Teal Fund. I'm just yeah. thinking Ashish Takar could have potentially been a beneficiary. Bill Gates when he dropped out, Mark Zuckerberg when he dropped out. Yeah. Uh Justin Stanford, one of the bright IT minds in this country dropped out in grade nine from a really good school called Paul Ruiz Gymnasium. Mm. Uh, he was funded by Johan Rupert. Yeah. Uh, minds like that, finding dope kids and being like, we're wasting this child's time. Let us give them everything they need and they must go out and fuck shit up and we'll support them as best as we can. We don't have enough people doing that. The, fund, the funds that we have even in SA are or just taking whoever is good academically and you give them a bursary and all that. Uh, that's cool. But like, what's the variance in that? There is no deviation in that. It's just like you're going to get the same result yeah. as much as you do it, right? What we lack is understanding that there are other people who are just above average brilliant, like yeah. way above. And the more we don't yield and take advantage of that is to our detriment. Because those are the people that shape 
uh, nations yeah. and they change things in time. But in Africa in general, we just don't have any space for people like that. They'll either, either call you, oh, why are you trying to, to, to be white or yeah. some yeah. dumb shit like that? Uh, I don't know if his name is Fred Sonica. I'll actually go research and check him out. Um, the founder of the African Leadership Academy um, in Hanichu, the West Rand. Yeah. And I think he's built the African Leadership University. It might be in Kigali in Rwanda. I'm not sure. But I, me I, I met uh, some of the students there. Renatus hosted me. He's from Tanzania. Mm. He's currently in Rwanda. And it sounds like the concept was something like that. And he got a lot of corporate guys to pump money, to be like, find kids. There's this rigorous in interview process, but find kids who are making an impact wherever they come from. Mm. And I think that's that's a good idea. And I, I look forward to you creating something like that. I think as we close I would, off, I would like to, to do it with my own money, though, not like to get it funded. Because then it's got a mandate. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, all those the corporate has its own agenda all the yeah, time. Yeah, of course. You know, and it's usually not in the best interest of people or whatever you're trying to achieve. So as much as it's nice to be funded, I think it's mostly low ball. Like you're always going to drop the ball somewhere. <laughs> in. They will take over. I've asked you, Tuzane Zuma. I've asked Vusi Tembewayo. I'm going to ask you now officially. Mm. What is the hype about Dubai? Why are guys wanting to live and be based and have networks in Dubai? It's a beautiful city, very expensive to live in. Mm -hmm. What's happening in Dubai that needs us to go there? So Dubai is all the problems that we, I was explaining that, okay, look, we, we have problems back home where people are not embraced at all. Um, they, the game that we play here incentivize the wrong people like all the time. So Dubai is the place that if you listen to the leader of Dubai, the ruler, even the interview from 15 years ago or 20 years ago, their mindset is different. They're deliberate with what they want to do. I can ask you a question. What is the identity of a South African right now? If, if you have to self-identify. It's tricky. Springboks, I'm a piano. Okay. Maybe. Sure. So, and then what do you think is the identity of a Rwandan? I wouldn't know, but ruled by Paul Kagame and making sure that they keep the streets clean. Exactly. Right. You added a, an attribute to that. So you can identify now with the Rwandan, you're qualifying them with saying they want the, the streets to be clean. Yeah. Right. So if you go to Rwanda, that's true, actually. They average Rwandan is very optimistic about the future, loves their country, and they don't just mess around. They're a clean person. They're tidy. Yeah. What about Germans? Uh, engineering, um, over decades, if not centuries, of engineering perfection, and then obviously gassing the Jews, unfortunately, under and, Hitler. And being on time. I'm, I'm talking about the average German. Don't, yeah, yeah no, not the political mm -hmm. jargon around it. But I'm just talking about the average person. You on know, the, time. The, the, the Germans are always on time, right? They're never late for anything. They'll be on time. A German person, bro, he would plan a trip from six months away. He booked the flights, the hotels, everything is done in advance. They were organized. I book all my flights a few hours away. <laughs> like I have a flight to Cape Town right now. Today, I still haven't booked it. Jeez. You know, so you have to, if you think about identities, Dubai is the perfect example of somebody who's trying to be the best, number one. And that's the attitude that's out there. So if you're someone who have value to bring into Dubai, you will be embraced in one way or another. It's easier to raise money if you have a real project. The rules are much more clear and the goal, the objective is clear. Dubai is trying to be number one. If you're going to try to help us to be number one, you're more than welcome. And the immigration process is also very direct. If I, to, For you to go to Dubai and start a company, they will tell you, okay, with, for the company that you're doing, Penuel, you need to work with that zone. They have uh, special economic zones. Yeah. And with your business, you're in media, Okay, you have to go into Shams. Shams will tell you to cost you $3,000 and the process will take you a week or two. It's done. Clear, clear, simple. In South Africa, for example, in many other African countries or in the world in general, mm -hmm. like these things aren't clear. Like if you're trying to move to South Africa, I know people who are like millionaires. They invested in millions of dollars in real estate here. They still don't have a, a permit to live in South Africa. Yeah. They have to, every 30 days, they have to go out Come, come back. back in. It's like because there is lack of cl clarity in terms of what's really the objective. Yeah. So Dubai gives you that 
from the legal perspective and also from a financing perspective. Dubai is trying to become the greatest city on the planet. Absolutely. And they're trying to attract the greatest minds on yeah. the planet. Yeah. They're trying to, anything you do, you just have to do it bigger. You want to start a company in Dubai, just do it big. You want to build the next building. I mean, we have Burj Khalifa. Yes. Try to beat that. Right. So the, the, the ceiling is basically way up and you feel small and you feel energized. Yeah. Right. You're not, and also it's not a political country at all. There is, you, you don't find anyone in Dubai watching the news. I don't even know what channel is there that you can find <laughs> the news. There is no politics. So it's just business and life without all the other. You, you, in Dubai, you're not worried about what is a woman. Those arguments, <laughs> don't, those arguments just don't exist. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> wow. You're not worried about all these things that people are busy with on social media. It's yeah. just life and business. Yeah. And I think that's for a lot of people who are driven, they just want to work and get things done. Mm -hmm. It removes all the noises that are out there that sort of gets you out of focus. Great. Thank you so much for visiting us. Um, no problem. I'm looking forward. You owe me a host in Dubai. <laughs> Anytime, bro. But I'd like to travel with you a little bit, man. Um, get into your head. Maybe let you get into my head a little bit and and see what we can do and hopefully find a tribe of unique people around the world that mm. are futuristic and progressive and are trying to move away from the noise because the noise is trying to keep us imprisoned and shackled in rubbish mm -hmm. to serve certain people when we're actually trying to build like a better world for as many cool people as possible. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, speaking to what you're saying about the noise, there was a, an interview with Ice Cube, I think with Tiger Carson. Okay. He was talking about that of how they just throw the conversation down the line to keep the masses speaking and arguing about things that don't yeah. even matter. Uh, this example, just to close up, uh, that, you know, people would complain about racism or sexism all they want or political parties. Yeah. But I, I, I identified that politics are exactly the same as sports, football. People who argue aren't really arguing for the better outcome of anything. They just enjoy the drama, the back and forth. Yeah. Just like football. You know, sports fans, they don't support teams to win. They don't like winning. People who like winning like me, I switch teams. Yeah. I used to be an Arsenal fan. Six years ago, I switched to Manchester City because it wins, it wants to win every game. My, bro it, my brother once said life is too short to support losers. Absolutely. So players switch the teams all the time. Because you want to win. You want to win. It's only the sports fan who is always loyal to the team because he doesn't really want to win. He just like the, the emotions of celebrating and the next day you're sad and the next day you're <laughs> back to it. That's what they enjoy. Yeah. I'm not into that game. I want to win, right? So you realize that politics is, is, is exactly the same, bro. Like... Democrats, Republican, ANC, DA, it's basically just talking points. Yeah. And these things have existed for a long time. They'll always be like this. Yeah. There is no perfect world. It's a competition, one trying to win over against the other or whatever. And it's very unfortunate that people have bought into that. But there are people like you who are trying to, I feel sorry for you sometimes. You, po <laughs> you post a lot of videos and even if it's thought provoking, you just get attacked for it. Mm. What, what do you, what's your outcome? What are you trying to achieve? Trying to colonize minds. And uh, I'm also trying to fix the algorithms in my mind mm. to try and strive for the greatest outcomes. If Dubai is trying to build the greatest city on the planet, I'm probably trying to build my mind to mm. become the greatest mind on the planet and to hopefully attract the greatest minds. And then I become a living real estate of Dubai mm -hmm. in myself. Do you think you'd be able to, how many people do you think you'd be able to change? So initially I wanted to influence as many people as possible. Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad. Mm. Um, I'm at a point in my journey where I'm trying to influence, uh, I guess you'd call it the Pope or the president, because mm. by default they enact yeah. the laws and the systems which then make me God in that nation. One of my favorite docu-series is uh, How to Become a Tyrant mm. on Netflix. Yeah. I look at those guys and I'm like, I'd like to try to do something like that so that I influence a lot of people, but not, because I realized that Twitter and the what what's not really working. 
uh, but a high level where if you speak about Pinnell's name in vain, you go to jail. And I'm like, <laughs> dope. Because I influenced the one right person. Yes. Instead of trying to convince the masses who are clowns. Mm. So but for, for now, that's, it's what stimulates me, what makes me happy and it keeps me busy. But I'm a minimalist, bro. I, my life goal currently is to have as many amazing children as possible. How many you have now? Six. Six. Yeah. How, how much more to go? My question to you is, how do you convince these women to have children with you? I, you know, you can do it in the most guerrilla way as possible, as many other guys do it. Yeah, yeah. But it's just unhealthy as well. Yeah, yeah. How do you manage to convince them and still able to maintain a family structure that you have? I don't know if I have a family structure. So my structure is kind of fucked up, but my mm. kids think I'm dope, which makes me happy. That's the most important part. That's the most important yeah. part, the end customer. Mm -hmm. uh, the mothers of my kids, I think, sort of think I'm okay-ish. And if they don't, people around them are like, hey, that penal guy is not bad. So yeah. that helps. Um, like Dubai, I guess it's propaganda and marketing mm. and um, portfolio of evidence. You mentioned the Burj Khalifa. Yeah. Uh, as my kids get older, if I can be like, there's my son, there's my daughter. The next girl who's an animal in the jungle is like, okay, that doesn't seem bad. I yes. think considering all the options out there, if I could have a kid like that. Mm. So the portfolio of evidence helps. So as I hopefully have <laughs> more kids and dope kids and they do dope shit, it becomes a selling point. How, how, how do you protect them from being, being influenced? You're interviewing me now. I, these are questions that I've always had uh, to, uh, to Please ask Please feel you. free to ask me questions. Yeah. So how do you make sure... My fear with having children is not having enough influence that maybe the mother of my children... Them. So if I have children, I would rather homeschool them. So let's see... Let's assume that the mother of my children thinks different. Yeah. Now I have to and go through... And most do. You see, they are suckers of the system. They're social, they're social animals, right? Yeah. Um, so in my view, I'm like, okay, so now I have to go through the battle of fighting this person yes. over what should happen to my children. Yes. I don't think I can take that really well. So it's the paranoia of the buck, the looking around, okay. which I had for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so you try environment, you spoke about environments as well. You try and place them in decent environments. You obviously try to breed with a woman that's mm -hmm. slightly different, which helps a lot. Um, my one hope, because it's a hope right now, yes. I don't have proof of concept of this. My one hope is that my genes come through. And at times when uh, shit hits the fan, I mean, my father was a wild animal. Mm. My mom was relatively well socialized, school, decent. And there were times in my pivotal points where I broke from the journey. And I, I think a part of it was my father's genetics because my father was a wild man. Mm. So I'm hoping that my kids, it will be similar. And because unlike my dad, I got to spend some time with him. My kids have now got a, they can see. So at any given time when they're confused and lost, they can be like, but I can go listen to this guy on a video. Hmm. I can go meet some of the people he's impacted and find out that your father was, was fucked up and he was different. And it was like, if my father was like that, then I, I should not be scared of anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if my dad was traveling the world and meeting these people and doing these things, why should I fear? If they get socialized, maybe into a mom or it's okay. And I think for my kids personally, their worst case, which is really not bad, is they have decent moms. They have great support systems. Mm. So they will become academics, go to a good tertiary institution and get good jobs. <laughs> and if that's the worst case scenario, ah, shame. It's not too bad. Yeah, it's not too bad. But if they decide to become animals, it's like... Have a yeah. good time. But, but they, that's, the, that's the best outcome, right? You want them to be monsters. The, best the worst yeah. outcome for society, not for me, is if yeah. they become uh, destructive to society because there's that. Oh, you want them to be monsters in the right way. I'd love them to be monsters in the right way. Yeah. Kanye West. But, but they, might, they might actually become tyrants and hurt people, which I know I have that in me. Mm -hmm. What they do then, I don't know. They might end up murdering me. Mm. Look, it's whatever. It's a gamble. Um, but I hope my genes... I, I think I've got strong, decent genes, and I hope it will be a guiding star for them. How do you protect them from other men's influence? Because having a structure that you have, I think one of the vulnerabilities in that system is you're dealing with women who are the mothers to your children, yeah. and women 
are can be influenced by men who are in their lives. Not just the men in their lives. Men on TV, their bosses, their fathers, their brothers. Right. All of that. But but I mean parents you sort of can understand because they already if you meet someone, you they more likely say have a certain percentage of influence from their parents or Do you do you worry about that? Um yes, I do worry about it. Don't. Because don't. <laughs> Well, look, it, this is the argument now. Is like, So if you have a normal family, woman-wife, I mean, the husband-wife structure, it gives a little bit of that protection, right? But yeah. if you have this wide, uh, or I would call it a, a, um, uh, a spectral system that you have, then it allows for other men to come into your life and influence if you're not influential enough yeah. for, set, for a number of reasons. Distance, money... Or you're just not a G enough to actually influence everybody. Like if you're dealing with six women, yeah. that's hard. How do you make sure? And if they come in, if another man comes in, they can come with their own ideas and 100%. agendas. And then your kids start taking on to them. 100%. So again, it's the bug paranoia. You need to let go of that. Okay. Um, while no, I, I want a solution. I don't want... Because now I've been in a wish, wishful thinking world. <laughs> I want like, this is the process. So you can marry a woman and live with her in a house and homeschool your kids mm. and try and limit social media. You can do all of that because you're fearful of external influence. No, I, I mean, social media is okay, but like, sure, yeah, another uh, person's Your influence. child will watch one video of Andrew Tate mm. or stumble up upon my content and your 30 years of grooming will be fucked in one day, in one sit down. Yeah. Which is why I said like, my biggest hope factor is my genes. Any man that influences my child beyond me, whether I'm living with the mom or not, or whether they're living in a foreign country and their mom's got this boyfriend who beats them up, he has to dominate their genes and dominate whatever influence I could have on them. Mm. And if they can't, my children will eat them. I say this because I look at my family. Mm. So forget my children. I look at my siblings, uh, my mother's kids and my father's kids. I look at my cousins. I look at my aunts and uncles. I go further into my ancestors. Mm. And I believe I'm the most superior form of all of them. My ancestors could come and fight and lose. My siblings, my cousins. If my kids are inferior to another man, whether I'm in their lives or not, they will be inferior. There's only so much I can oh, do. Oh, I see. So it's, you're looking but at it from a Darwinian perspective. What's that? Darwin. Darwin, yeah. So, so yeah, if my kids are inferior, is They're probably whatever, just weak. But... Like I said, I think genetically from what I've seen, if my genes kick in, because so I look at case studies of all the kids who were raised by their mom mm. and then the guy turns 20, 25, 30. And then there's something inside that burns for his father. And you're mm. like, your father was a bum, but the guy wants his dad. Mm. And you're like, but your mom did. It's like, I don't give a fuck. There are people who were raised by adopted families. There are people that were raised by white people, but for some reason are they craving this African... There's something that is bigger than you. If you switch it on, or if someone traumatizes you, you see mm. the danger of trauma. If someone traumatizes you heavy enough, they break you, and when they break you, you're forced to go back to your core. And at that point, boy, when you're depressed, when you're broke, when a girl breaks your heart, Something kicks in and that's the lion aspect that like you don't have to train a lion to hunt and tear apart because mm -hmm. it's you can send them to Timon and Pumbaa to eat the bugs. But when shit hits the fan. Yeah, it's the lion. And the lion. if my kids don't have that, they can spend a hundred years with me. They'll never have it. Right. And they will be maybe their moms or their uncles. And again, they will go and get nice jobs. <laughs> and that's good enough for me. Okay, so just maximize that for me before we close in a society context so you're saying that look you what you're saying is basically a darwinian concept of like look the weak are just going to get eaten yeah it is what it is yeah. so what does that say about society as a whole then because we're running on the premise that everyone is equal and that's how the world should be you know flowers and rainbows there's no such thing Okay, and then so what's then what's the point of you creating the content that you create? Because most of it is political. If you believe at the same time that uh, the weak are gonna get eaten, um, look, I don't think there's a purpose to life. I think we born, we die, and we keep ourselves busy in the middle. Mm. Whether it's I want to make babies or I want to run a podcast, 
Of all the options that are out there, becoming a billionaire, becoming a super sports star, becoming a Denzel Washington actor, creating an app, becoming wealthy in Bitcoin, the idea of colonizing minds and influencing influencing them to my worldview and mm-hmm. bending them to my will is the most stimulating endeavor right. I have found currently. Okay. And that's essentially the only reason I'm doing this. Um are we going to talk gossip? Are we going to talk politics? Are we going to speak Arsenal beat Man City? <sighs> Whatever it is, as for me, as long as I'm stimulated. Yes. And if there's a chance that everywhere you go in life, I've traumatized your brain in some way, and you think of pain and, you know, that makes me happy. <laughs> but once I've figured out how to build the systems, there'll be a bigger impact because right. essentially that's what I want. And maybe what Dubai got right is they found the people that can build the systems. And maybe that's what I need to find. I need to go and find the guys who have built the systems for Islam, for the Catholic Church at the Vatican, for Christianity, and say, mm-hmm. I want you to come in. I mean, I sat with Joshua Maponga once, and one of the things he was telling me, because he studied theology, he was like, uh, write your scriptures and then come to me and I'll help you with the framework. And maybe I need to go and visit him, and maybe right. that's why we're having this chat. I want to build the system so that people are praying five times a day, wearing Depending black on. all the time. Uh, kissing a picture of Penel, you know, <laughs> wearing a certain chain. And they fundamentally believe, like you said, you don't give a fuck what I say or anyone says because you're like, Bitcoin is garbage and doesn't work. Mm. Okay, I guess my life is garbage, doesn't work, but yeah. I'm winning. Yeah, Are you winning? You and your dollars? Mm. Doesn't look like it. I want to find people who are going to bind to my garbage and who are like, I lost weight. I get along with my partner. My children are strong and healthy and independent of mind and they've traveled and I can't assign it to anything else but this random weird guy called Penwell. So I believe in this system and I endorse it for other people. I think, yeah, I mean, thanks for sharing that. I think that is the the number one single important thing in the world is projecting your worldview on other people. Yeah. Because that's what life is all about. That's, that's what, what life is all about. It's, it's, all, it's all about that. This thing yeah. that we call South Africa today, it's someone else's idea. And it's only a success to him because he actually made it. People bought all of it. All of us are just subjects to it. 100%. You know, America or everything else is exactly the same. Um, uh, who is this guy? Shamath Pelahapatia yes. shares the same concept. He says he just wants to make as much money as, as possible just so that he can sit at the table of people who actually make career direction of what the world should be and yeah. what it should not. So, yeah. That's all I want. From from birth, if I can implant the software in your brain that dictates what your dreams and your goals are mm. and defines what is valuable and what is not, um, I will have achieved my goal and it will make me happy. I'm sure Putin uh, probably has the same... People like Putin probably, that's what they think about. 100%. If I think about it. Anyone who's liberated to some degree, as you said, that is the only pursuit to, number one, define your worldview and then impose it on everyone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully I get recruit, recruited. No, you must help me. You've got the Bitcoin. You must fucking fund the revolution. Well, so. then it's no longer your concept. Then I'll have to to influence it in some form. I'll hack your mind. George Soros is one of the guys that have done that successfully. Mm-hmm. Do you know that he paid for a lot of guys in in the uh, during the apartheid era? The, a lot of freedom fighters were funded by him. He's, um, he has a open foundation. Yeah. Yeah, they funded some of the politicians here actually who were part of the struggle. Mm-hmm. So he has done that in so many different places in the world that he's now considered a villain. Yeah, yeah. I've so, heard the story of George Soros. I'm, sh- uh, I'm sure you're Bill ready Gates, for Bill Gates as well, and he funds a lot of the journalists and a lot of foundations. Um, they make me angry mm-hmm. and fuck them, and they're destructive. But I realize it's because I have a different worldview. Exactly. And because I want to challenge their worldview, because I believe that mine is better. It, that's what it is. Yeah. You just saw, I'm, I'm sure you're ready for the blowback because now you see when they talk about conspiracy theorists, Illuminati, they put a picture of George Soros on it. Just be ready that 10 years from now, they'll be, I mean, when you a lot order, maybe 30 years from now, they'll yeah. be putting Penuel next to it. Yeah. This is the guy who controls the world. It's Klaus Schwab, Penuel, and a couple of other guys. It's the cost, it's the cost of control, and it's pretty dope. Uh, I'm not ready to pay the price. 
but I hope at some point I, I will be. Uh, but like I said, it's just to stimulate me. If I wake up tomorrow and I'm happy to go and be a guru in a mountain in India and just live in a hut and people come to me to touch me and get blessings, I'll shift. That's gonna but be I'm enjoying that's what gonna I'm getting be, That's going to be depressive. But to you now. Yeah. But if I as shift. A, as an observer, you know. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for the conversation. At least I asked some questions as well of what. I appreciate it. That, that I makes it more of a conversation than most others. A lot of people come here as guests for interviews and I constantly have to remind the audience because they're not used to conversations. Mm. They're used to interviews. So what do you eat? Where do you go? They're not used to, I ask you something, you engage, you share, and then you could be like, what do you think of? Yeah. Then it's a conversation. It's going to take a while. And sometimes people are like, but you speak more than the guest. I'm like, sometimes in conversations, I'll speak more. You're used to interviews where I ask a question and shut up. The reason people don't watch interviews is because they're not stimulating. And that's why they want conversations. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think it's, it's pretty dope that you ask me questions. It's what TV does to people, right? So I would I like to say that if I have kids, there'll be no TV in my house. Like ever since I started st living alone, I never had a TV in the house. And the reason I find this is that TV is one way communication. Yes. Internet is interactive sure. back and forth. So like my man said here, they watch too much ENCA. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this because I know Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Chamat himself, they yeah. keep their kids from social media. Mm -hmm. Depending on how much time and influence and energy you have, don't scrap the TV and the social media. Curate it. Mm. Because if you curate it correctly, it will be more powerful than... I mean, my firstborn son was in China and he asked me a random question on Skype. He's like, Baba, do you know Andrew Tate? Mm. I was so fucking excited. So if you can curate your children's social media and TV feed, I, I've told parents, more National Geographic, more History Channel, less Cartoon Network. Mm. Uh, people in South Africa are like, yeah, TikTok in China is different to... My TikTok, I'm, I'm in South Africa, is different from yours because yeah. you watch bombs and I'm a piano and garbage. I want to see engineering and thought-provoking stuff and philosophy. You can curate. Mm. So if you can get your kids in that mindset and tell them, you will only watch these channels. Make good practice to be a dictator and worldview. Yeah, but, but, but you so, know, th there is... A point, though, for curating social media at a, at a national level of what you want your people to be influenced in. I think there is a point to that. 100%. Something that probably need to be worked on. Like uh, Mpo Dagada, a friend of mine. Yes, he's got a political party. He has a political party now. Yeah. So I don't know if I should be saying this, but I remember I met him in Dubai two years ago at a conference. And he was telling me he, he wasn't even planning to, to run for president or anything. So we're talking about this kind of subjects and it was like, if I became president, I mean, I would remove, I would make porn illegal. As it is in China. Because I don't see what purpose that it serves. Mm -hmm. And I actually do agree with him. Like, if you're trying to build a nation, you have to, you need to have, or a family, you need to have intent and direct outcome that you want. And certain things definitely need to be controlled. People love strict fathers. We're seeing it now. They're calling it dictatorship which dictatorship has a lot of negative connotations. What people are seeing in China, in Russia and other places, and maybe Rwanda. Mm. No, Rwanda seeing, is dope. Have you been to Rwanda? Bro? I haven't. Man. I need to go. They're seeing a strict father that has values, discipline, and a way forward. Because mm. uh, people have accepted that I am not smart enough, good enough on my own. Yeah. I need you to tell me where to go. Uh, we look at Muslims today and, and how organized they are. Yeah. And it's people are just like, I wish I had a strict dad or a strict mom. Mm -hmm. And to what you're saying, that's what it is. So curate for me because on my own, I will yeah. watch the porn and the garbage. But if you create oh, for right. me, when I go out into the world, I'll be like, we don't have this. Yes. And people are like, oh, my God, why are you Germans always on time? Maybe it's because we were beaten back home. And if you were late, you'd be the person isolated to a point where you changed. Yes. So now you look cool everywhere else because your dad taught you how to work hard, how to be punctual, how to be neat, how to do a good job because you had a strict parent. I think people need m more heuristics than laws. They, What's heuristics? It's things that you do without understanding why. So if someone Se can... Second nature. Building habits that become second yeah, nature. Exactly. Okay. Almost like saying don't sleep under a dead tree. It can be an old tradition in, Afri in some African nation, but it's because someone else died before. And then it just became a heuristic. Uh, but traveling wise, so let's go to Bali next month. How does Please. that sound? Le you don't need a visa there. 
Yeah, but I need money to get there. But we'll chat off camera. Okay. Great job, Isi. Thank you so much for visiting us. Cheers, man. Thanks. Easy. This was great. <laughs> <laughs> I think that could be one of the longest. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, guys. No, 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 we love the long ones. This was great.